The Subcommittee on Communications and Technology will now come to order. And the Chair recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the Subcommittee on Communication and Technology's first legislative hearing of this new Congress. Today, we will be discussing the Save the Internet Act, which I introduced last week, along with 132 of our colleagues here in the House. First, this legislation would restore popular, bipartisan, common sense net neutrality protections and put a cop back on the beat to protect consumers, small businesses, and competitors from unjust and unreasonable practices by Internet service providers. Second, this bill would give the FCC the authority to protect consumers now and in the future through forward-looking regulatory authority. Third, this bill would restore the Commission's legal authority to support broadband access and deployment programs through the Universal Service Fund. These programs pay for the deployment of broadband in rural communities through the Connect America Fund and support access to working families, seniors, and veterans through the Lifeline Program. The Save the Internet Act would enact permanent, effective net neutrality protections in the law by codifying the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order as a new freestanding section of law. That would ensure the Internet remains an open platform for innovation and competition regardless of political changes at the FCC. By authorizing the order as a freestanding part of the U.S. Code, this legislation also permanently prevents the FCC from applying 27 sections of Title II of the Communications Act, as well as over 700 regulations, which is the majority of Title II uh, to Internet service providers. The bill also permanently prohibits the FCC from engaging in rate regulation or requiring broadband providers unbundle their network. Last but not least, the Save the Internet Act restores the Commission's ability to police unjust and unreasonable practices by ISPs. The approach that we're discussing here today charts a new course for net neutrality and puts in place 21st century rules for a 21st century Internet. In doing so, we remove much of the regulatory overhang of Title II that ISPs and our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have long complained about. Opponents of this legislation need to explain to their constituents which unjust and unreasonable practices they want ISPs, ISPs to engage in and why they want to allow such practices. Americans broadly and overwhelmingly support these rules. Polls have shown that 88 percent of Republicans, independents, and Democrats support restoring strong net neutrality protections. This bill is a new approach and an open invitation to our colleagues and ISPs alike to come together and support a new way forward because a free and open Internet is critical for so many communities and sectors of our economy and because broadband connectivity touches almost every aspect of our economy, politics, and culture. I encourage my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to seriously consider this legislation. Whether you're a rural broadband provider based in Idaho, like Mr. Green's company, Fatbeam, or you're working to ensure that minority and underrepresented voices get heard online, like Mrs. Ocella's organization, or you have heard from millions of constituents who have called or emailed their elected representatives, the message the people are sending us is clear. We need to restore strong net neutrality rules, and that's exactly what this bill does. Together, we hope to advance this legislation through the Congress and restore these essential protections for all Americans. I would also like to remind my friends, and particularly my friends on the other side of the aisle, that this is the bill that is before the committee today, and this is the issue we're discussing. I am happy to talk to members about other issues at the appropriate time for them to be brought before the subcommittee, but for today, this bill is the subject of our discussion. And with that, uh, 29 seconds remaining, I would now like to represent my friend and colleague, Mr. Latta, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to our witnesses for being with us today. Glad you're here. 
Well, I'm always happy to be here with my colleagues to learn more from the real experts on important issues in the telecom space. I have to admit I am confused why we need to spend another entire hearing on net neutrality less than a month after talking about the same thing. In the meantime, the majority has introduced essentially the same bill that has already failed to garner the support of their entire caucus as a CRA in the last Congress. Make no mistake, there are a lot of different ways for Congress to go about protecting consumers with permanent net neutrality rules. For example, the bill I introduced last month is based on Chairman Waxman's approach in 2010, and my colleagues, Republican Leader Walden and Mrs. Rogers, offered two more bills based on the rules from FCC's 2015 order in Washington State's bipartisan legislation from 2018. These bills all originated from Democratic net neutrality proposals or laws. Anyone interested in a bipartisan legislative solution would consider each of them to be a reasonable starting point for real discussion. In contrast, the majority came to that hearing with no ideas. Since that time, we have not heard a word from them until they were ready to announce yet another net neutrality hearing. Worst of all, instead of engaging with us to try to solve the problem, my colleagues have retrenched back to the most extreme position in this debate. The idea that only Title II is real net neutrality is dangerous and wrong. Those who are newer to the subcommittee or to this debate should not be fooled. You have heard over and over again that we need to protect consumers from blocking, throttling, and internet fast lanes, which sounds reasonable enough. Well, we can easily do all of, these, of this without giving the government free reign over the internet through the specter of Title II. Everyone who has followed this net neutrality debate or on even the most superficial level is aware that Title II is a non-starter with Republicans and even with some Democrats. It has no chance of even passing the Senate or being signed into law. Yet, here we are in a repetitive hearing followed by a string of uh, partisan victories that will simply ensure that anyone digs in, if, if that anyone digs in further and nothing meaningful ever gets done to protect consumers. Even if there were a chance that the majority's Title II bill would become law, we now know unequivocally that it would be the wrong direction for rural America. As we heard from Mr. Fresnel at the last hearing and from countless other rural carriers as well, Title II was, had, was a devastatingly effect of investment killer for small ISPs who need to be expanding to serve more of our constituents in rural America. At that hearing, so many members on both sides of the aisle engaged Mr. Fresnel with questions and concerns about this impact. There seems to be an overwhelmingly bipartisan interest in working to close the digital divide and get modern broadband service out to the communities are being left behind. So why aren't we spending our time working together on that instead of putting the crushing regulatory regime of Title II back onto the folks we need to be out there investing and expanding? It makes no sense. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. Words like net neutrality and open internet don't capture how central this issue is for our society. We're talking about what the country stands for. We're talking about saving economic opportunity and innovation, saving our kids' educational opportunities, and saving our democracy. And it's that important. Without net neutrality, a free and open internet simply does not exist. We've all heard the fears of our constituents, in my district, small businesses like Rockstar Bakery and Second Life Bikes in Asbury Park are concerned that without net neutrality, their businesses could be blocked from reaching their customers. They worry large corporations could buy fast lanes, which would make their businesses less competitive. Conservatives and liberals alike worry about their voices being shut down by corporations that don't agree with their point of view. And without access to a free and open internet, my constituents are worried it would be harder to find a job, harder to get the training they need, and harder for their kids to keep up at school. After all, today people need the internet to find good paying jobs and to prepare their children to succeed in life. A free and open internet isn't just about making sure that we can watch videos on our computers or on our phones. It's much more than that. It's about protecting free speech, commerce, creativity, and innovation. And that's why it's sad that even we even have to hold this hearing on legislating to safeguard the internet. The FCC's order in 2015 established strong net neutrality rules, and that was upheld twice in federal court. The debate about net neutrality was over. Consumers and small businesses were protected. 
But the Trump FCC defied the American people and rolled back those common sense protections. It didn't matter that polling showed that 86% of Americans supported these protections, nor did it matter that a historic 24 million people commented on their action and the overwhelming majority in opposition. And that's why this committee must act. The Save the Internet Act will restore the meaningful net neutrality protections Americans want. It will stop this FCC or a future FCC from undermining free speech, small businesses, and consumers. And we have to act swift, swiftly. There's no time for delay. Without net neutrality, we're already seeing the slow march of anti-consumer behavior. ISPs are charging Internet users more for using their smartphone's Internet connection on another device. In other instances, they are charging consumers more for watching high-definition videos. And that is not what a free and open Internet looks like. So that's why I'm very happy that so many of my colleagues have joined with Chairman Doyle in signing on as original co-sponsors of his legislation. After unveiling the Save the Internet Act last Wednesday, the bill was introduced with 132 original co-sponsors. And the Save the Internet Act will bring back the FCC's commonplace bedrock principles. It will put a cop on the beat at the FCC and protect Americans and small businesses from abusive and discriminatory network practices. Now, with that, I'd like to yield one minute to the vice chair of our subcommittee, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, uh, whatever time uh, she may consume. Thank you, um, Chairman Pallone. As you know, pay, par pay partization has been a priority of mine for several years, and I think we all agree that calls terminating at public safety answering points shouldn't be dropped, and various content delivery systems and network traffic operations have become important parts of the Internet ecosystem that can improve the consumer experience. The core issue here is ensuring consumers don't have to pay more for the same products and services online. And it doesn't take a technologist to know when you're getting a bad deal. I am mindful of the potential use cases that next generation networks can facilitate. And I previously introduced legislation to ensure that allowing all consumers to access content equally remains at the center of the important debate on the service requirements and consumer benefits of our open internet policies. I am very pleased that we're having this hearing and I feel it's very, very necessary. We need a free and open internet and hearings like this are very necessary. Thank you and I yield back. Does the gentleman yield back his Yes, time? I do, thank the you. The gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thank you for having this hearing. Before I start, I just have a, a question for the chair. Does 18 U.S.C. Section 101 uh, involving false statements to Congress apply to witnesses who testify here even if they don't stand up and swear in? It does. Okay, thank you. I want to I thank our witnesses, especially our sole Republican witness, Mr. McDowell. It's always good to have you before the committee. A permanent legislative solution produced in good faith with our Democratic colleagues is the only way to protect consumers, innovation, and an open Internet. I've repeatedly called for an end to this ridiculous partisan back and forth. It's time for bipartisan legislation that could actually become law. And I think we could find common ground as this committee has a history of doing. Yet even after offering a menu of bipartisan legislative proposals at our hearing last month to preserve an open internet once and for all, unfortunately, my friends on the other side have not decided to work with us on a bipartisan solution, and I'm, I'm really disappointed. The partisan approach is not the answer. It will not become law. Title II is not necessary to preserve a free and open internet. We could permanently ban blocking, we could permanently ban throttling, and to Ms. Matsui's concerns, we could permanently ban paid prioritization without the heavy-handed approach of Title II. We heard last month about the regulatory impact of Title II on rural broadband deployment from a small internet service provider, Mr. Joe Fresnel of Eastern Oregon Telecom. Indeed, he's from my district in Eastern Oregon and across rural America. It's where we rely on small ISPs like Eastern Oregon Telecom to help connect our communities with high-speed Internet. In an opinion piece in the East Oregonian that's running this morning, Joe wrote that the heavy hand of Title II shifted Eastern Oregon Telecom's focus from our consumers to regulatory interference and draining cost of reporting and compliance, close quote. 
Joe went on to say that every dollar he spends on reporting to regulatory agencies is a dollar not spent on serving rural Oregon. Frankly, Title II could provide the federal government near unlimited and unchecked authority to uh, regulate and tax, regulate and tax the Internet. It's not an Internet that protects consumers, nor is that an Internet that will allow for American ingenuity to thrive. I think we could do better. I'd also like to take note that the Internet seems to be working today, despite all the hyperbolic rhetoric to the contrary last year. So what Internet crisis brings us to the hearing room today? It's certainly not the abuses by the tech platforms that occupy the news every day, not the limiting of conservative voices on social media, shadow banning and throttling and things of that nature, not the seeming inability to curb harmful and illicit behavior online, not how tech companies make their deals to prioritize Internet traffic on the off-ramps, not their own agreements on sharing of people's personal information. No, that's, that's not what brings us here today. What brings us here is that Speaker Pelosi still believes broadband providers are the real threat, and so I assume directed the majority to move this bill. The Internet of today grew dramatically with little or no government interference. Saddling it now with an archaic regulation from the 1930s monopoly-era copper landline phone company seems like an odd way to spur investment and innovation. Meanwhile, big tech companies want complete freedom, not just from regulation, but also from liability for facilitating all sorts of harmful and illicit activity. Twenty years ago, a Republican Congress and a Democratic president granted special liability limitations to help the tech se sector to flourish. This is Section 230 of the Telecom Act of 1996, and without objection, this bipartisan agreement accomplished its primary objective. Online platforms are now major venues for communication and commerce, and not just in the United States, but around the world. But Section 230 was also supposed to be about responsibility. With a liability limitation in their back pocket, we increasingly see the tech giants wield their power at the wrong targets. When will this subcommittee seriously consider the role of edge providers, either as common carriers in the information age, or how they are the ones with business models that actually use our data for their profits? If you're going to protect consumers online, should those online protections apply to the whole Internet ecosystem? Meanwhile, Mr. Chairman, we should hear directly from the Federal Communications Commission about how this legislation will impact the vitality of the Internet. I was under the impression the majority planned to have the FCC up here to testify in the first quarter of this year. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet. From a process standpoint and considering the need for the full commission to weigh in on the impact of this proposal, Mr. Chairman, will you commit to letting us have a hearing with the commissioners before this measure is, is ushered through in a markup? I know Ms. Eshoo was quite vocal last summer when Republicans wanted to match our bipartisan success of enacting the FCC reauthorization with completing an NTIA reauthorization. Despite having had numerous hearings that included NTIA's administer, administrators as well as former administrators and interested parties, there was still a demand by the Democrats to have Mr. Reddell appear again before our following our legislative hearing. So I'd like to know is, can we have the commission here before we're asked to mark up this legislation? I'll make sure to let you know when we invite them. That's a little different, but thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, for your response. And I yield back. I would just say to my friend, and he is my friend, uh, that I must have missed the phone call uh, when you said, let's get together and sit down and see if we can work together on net neutrality. Uh, what we got instead was three bills being dropped without our knowledge uh, before any of us knew about it. Uh, I would just suggest to the gentleman that that's not the way to work together. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, for four or five years, I've had an open door. I've had draft legislation, and I've publicly and privately offered up the opportunity to sit down and work through these things. And the idea of having three bills out there was simply to say, here's a menu of options. We didn't expect you to co-sponsor those. But we remain willing to work with you to find a bipartisan Yeah, solution. I'm glad your door's open. Mine is, too. And I just, uh, if you had wandered into it, we might have had a conversation before you dropped the bills. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair wants to remind members uh, that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written open statements will be made part of the record. Uh, before I introduce our witnesses, I do want to uh, recognize and introduce a former member of Congress and a member of this Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, former Congressman Ron Klink is in the audience. Ron, nice to see you. Welcome. Yeah, you could clap for Ron. <laughs> okay, I'd now like to introduce our witnesses. Oh, up. 
and, and, and standing right in front of me, Chip Pickering, please, Chip, also a member of the committee. Sorry, Chip. Okay, now, let's get to today's witnesses. Ms. Francella, Francella, Francella Ocello, woo, Vice President of Policy and General Counsel for the National Hispanic Media. We also have Mr. Gregory Green, Chief Executive Officer of FatBeam. Uh, Mr. Former Commissioner Robert McDowell, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and partner at Cooley LLP. And last but not least, Mr. Matt Wood, Vice President of Policy and General Counsel for Free Pe Press Action. Uh, we want to thank all of our witnesses for joining us here today. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Um, you're each going to have five minutes to do your opening statement. Uh, we do not have the lighting system here in front of you, uh, but we'll be tracking this here. Uh, and once you get to your five minutes, you'll hear a little gentle tap of the gavel and know that uh, it's time to wrap up your testimony if you haven't already done so. So we'll start with Ms. Ocello. You are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, and other members of the subcommittee. My name is Francello Cholo. I am the Vice President of Policy and General Counsel at the National Hispanic Media Coalition based in Pasadena, California. For years, NHMC has advocated for free and open internet. We help policymakers and lawmakers like you understand the impact and what's at stake for Americans who do not have the resources or the capacity to engage in these types of debates in Washington, DC. Today, my comments are int intended to reflect those voices including families, students, creators, and activists who support a free and open internet but do not have the good fortune of being able to join us in this room. <laughs> the net neutrality consumer protections that we have fought so tirelessly to restore were always intended to safeguard an open and free internet, the one that we envision for tomorrow. Access to that open internet has revolutionized the way that we think, the way that we work, the way that we communicate, the way that we learn, it's challenged the way that we see each other and tested our willingness to grow. In all of its wonder, the internet has also been one of the most important tools in remedying a long history of discrimination that still plagues our country. Taking messages online was the only way that activists were able to get the nation to stop and listen to the cries of Native Americans protecting sacred lands in North Dakota and how disenfranchised voices were able to put a spotlight on unarmed African-American men being shot by police. Online social justice movements forced people to stop and ask hard questions about contaminated water in Flint and why families seeking asylum at the border were irreconcilably se separated from their children. But when there's a premium for access, the dangerous underbelly of the internet exposes people to a risk whether or not you're online. Creating a digital caste system of those who can afford to pay more, it feeds the dark chambers of the internet where division and hate speech and discrimination thrive. Sunlight and open access, that is the best remedy because this internet has connected us in a way that historically our nation has been unable to do so. It serves as the digital encyclopedia where students can go to find out why the Japanese should have never been in internment, ca internment camps or the many reasons why Jim Crow was wrong. Being able to discover those unpleasant truths about who we are as a nation and how we grow together requires that all Americans have access to the same information. Under the current regulatory framework, ISPs have no obligation to transmit messages as is. There are no rules that prevent them from blocking content online, slowing down certain websites, or giving preferential treatment. In essence, they have the power to decide what we see online and whose voices are heard. Simply put, this is a dangerous experiment at the expense of the American people, which should give all of us pause. The United States regularly ranks as one of the most expensive places for inter internet among developed countries in the world, and affordability remains the main barrier to adoption. In 2018, approximately 24 million people still did not have access to broadband of any kind. 40% of those people, were 40% of Americans living in rural communities had no access, and 60% of people living on tribal lands faced the same fate. 
These Americans, all on the wrong side of the digital divide, regularly find their opportunities for growth, their opportunity to participate in our democracy, as well as their upward mobility that is directly linked to their level of access. If we can find a way to provide Wi-Fi for astronauts while they're out of space, I don't understand why we can't find a way to connect people in Peoria, Illinois, or Augusta, Georgia, or Brownsville, Texas, or Chimayo, New Mexico, or even in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. We have a choice. We can affirmatively protect the internet that was started with public funds and always intended for public good, or we can hope that this digital caste system of the haves and the haves nots steers clear of the communities that we call home. We have a responsibility to ensure that every American has an opportunity to participate as well as a responsibility to understand the insurmountable cost and the consequences when they are disconnected. Because while they may shoulder the individual burden, there is a collective cost. If this is in fact the digital, digital re revolution, then that means that we are having one of the most important conversations of our time. And we need to be vigilant about understanding the consequences of creating an internet where some have basic and limited access and others get a VIP pass. We have to decide what type of digital infrastructure that we plan to leave behind for generations to come. And the only question that remains is did we stand up for them when we had the chance? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Green for five minutes. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Latta, thank you very much. Uh, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for having me. I'm Gregory Green. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Fatbeam. Fatbeam is a small ISP and fiber-based infrastructure provider in the West Coast. Today, Fatbeam operates in seven markets, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Oregon. We also just opened a region in Southwest region in Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. We build fiber optic networks in typically markets tier two and tier three, 150,000 in population and below. And in those markets, we provide healthcare providers, government agencies, schools, education, higher ed, and other businesses and institutions open access to our network, which in, in, in also means that we share our fiber network with other ISPs such that they can deliver residential and other services that maybe we don't initially provide in that market space. I've always been a proponent of net neutrality. Um, Fabbeam supports net neutrality, and we support very much the FCC order in 2015 for net neutrality. In fact, since net neutrality, we've invested in eight new markets uh, for the, from the order coming out in 2015. Overall, we've invested $30 million in fiber-based infrastructure, not wireless, but fiber-based infrastructure, and we're in 40 markets, as I mentioned, that we operate today. The driver for that is obviously, or the demand for our inventory and our, and our product set is driven by our customers. When there's a need, uh, we will prevail and we provide that solution. And we very much enjoy coming into a marketplace that is re requesting demand and services when in fact there's only maybe an incumbent of a cable company and a phone company in place. In 2017, I wrote a letter an open letter supporting the rules uh, for net neutrality. I was concerned about the repeal and I remain so today. Um, I have 20 plus years in the organization and I'm, I'm very confident that over those years we've had many successes including that in the cellular industry where we use utilize tit Title II. Um, there's a fallacy that seems to be out there that there's a, a history and the fallacy of investment where AT&T and Comcast and others would possibly invest less money uh, if net neutrality were to continue. And having looked at those actual numbers, there may have been a smaller investment but, but was very, very minuscule. We continue to invest today and we continue to grow our business and net neutrality is a very large component of that because we believe in the foundation that net neutrality provides for equal access for everyone. Um, we know that in a lot of marketplaces that 70% of the consumers only have one choice for their ISP and we, we do not feel that as a competitive, uh, it may be a competitive advantage but it's not an open access advantage so that the consumer ends up with what they need at the end of the day. They need competition, they need a, a landscape which they can count on and investment in the community. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a businessman. 
Um, but I was very much part of the Bipartisan, Bipartisan Telecommunications Act of 1996 when Craig McCaw and myself and a lot of other gentlemen uh, began the path down a company called Nextlink. If you remember the name Nextlink and Craig McCaw, uh, we built a company called Nextlink. It later became Exo Communications, one of the first CLEX in the United States. We raised $400 million during that time. And the Telecommunications Act of 96 gave us that very opportunity to do so. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I appreciate the opportunity that you've provided us to be a part of this. I'd like to say uh, that we very much support net neutrality and we will uh, answer any questions that you may have today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, Chair now recognizes Commissioner McDowell for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. Uh, it's great to be here. Ranking Member Lada, uh, Chairman Pallone, and Ranking Member uh, Walden. It is an honor always to be back before your committee, so thank you. Uh, I did serve at the FCC from 2006 to 2013. I'm a partner at Cooley LLP. I'm also a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute, but I testify today only in my personal capacity and the views today uh, that I express are purely my own. <clears throat> the debate over the best way to keep the internet open and freedom enhancing has raged for about 15 years. While the national political pendulum has swung back and forth during that time, the American internet ecosphere has blossomed as the most powerful explosion of entrepreneurial brilliance in human history. And let's make no mistake, the American internet market is the envy of the world. The legal and regulatory framework that provided the necessary certainty and protections for the phenomenon that became the internet was rooted in consumer protection, pro-competition, and antitrust statutes, such as the Federal Trade Commission Act, the Clayton Act, the Sherman Act, as well as tort and contract common law, among others. Furthermore, a fundamental ingredient in this successful public policy recipe was Title I of the Communications Act of 1934. A quarter century ago, at the time of the Internet's privatization, the Clinton-Gore administration made a wise choice to insulate the Internet ecosphere from the heavy-handed regulation of Title II of the 1934 Act. This monumental decision, made at a crucial tipping point in the historical arc of the net, enjoyed not only bipartisan and un nearly unanimous support here in the US, but internationally as well. In short, reliance on this time-tested legal construct created an environment where ideas hatched in dorm rooms or garages could become some of the most successful companies in the world in just a handful of years. Light touch regulation not only allowed the internet's edge to flourish, but it also provided the certainty and stability needed for the capital markets to take the leap to invest more than $1.6 trillion in private risk capital in broadband infrastructure since the mid-1990s. Furthermore, it was not that long ago uh, that the FCC itself issued unanimous and bipartisan orders classifying broadband internet access service across all platforms as an information service. I supported such, such efforts in concert with my Democratic colleagues as recently as 2007. Needless to say, the political and public policy atmosphere has changed a few times since then. The FCC has attempted to regulate broadband services in various ways over the past 11 years, including by classifying broadband as a Title II telecommunications service for the first time in early 2015. And most recently, it acted in December of 2017 to restore the pre-2015 legal framework that was proven to work so well. To be clear, I do not think that additional legislation is needed to protect consumers, startups, or broadband investment. The proof is in the pudding of the Internet's brief but brilliant history. Nonetheless, the public policy pendulum has been swinging back and forth above the heads of Internet entrepreneurs like the sword of Damocles and has created uncertainty and it's counterproductive. For instance, anticipating the uncertainty in, the 20, in 2015 surrounding the Title II classification, there's evidence that capital markets showed their, uh, slowed their investment in broadband infrastructure. After the Restoring Internet Freedom Order of 2018, investment in broadband rebounded. The time has come, however, for Congress to provide clarity and certainty by enacting new legislation. Such an effort could end this era of bitter and vitriolic zero-sum advocacy where in order for one faction to win, others must lose. The 116th Congress serves during a unique period in the Internet's history, and it has the power 
to forge a reasonable majority to craft new bipartisan legislation that could last for decades and serve as a beacon for an open and freedom enhancing internet across the globe. Any bill passed by this house must have a reasonable chance to garner 60 votes in the Senate if there's to be any hope of it becoming law. The only path to that goal of meaningful, positive, and constructive public policy for the internet, a law that will last beyond election cycles of two to four to eight years, is through finding that majority that offers a win-win-win scenario for all who build and are affected by the internet. Without a large bipartisan majority, any legislative effort is largely symbolic. A hopeful starting point, however, could begin with the principles laid out by FCC Chairman Michael Powell in 2005, some of which were echoed by Chairman Julius Janikowski in 2010, such as no anti-competitive throttling, blocking, or prioritization. This Congress has a rare opportunity to create a lasting legacy for the internet ecosphere, and I look forward to helping you achieve it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Wood for five minutes. Chairman Doyle and Pallone, Ranking Member Lada and Walden, and Subcommittee members, thank you for inviting me back. Free Press Action is a nonpartisan nonprofit with 1.4 million members around the country, and we support H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act. Our members know that having equitable access to technology and information is the key to making change and making a living. Net neutrality is an issue of economic and racial justice. It's a timeless non-discrimination law safeguarding people's rights to say and see what they want online, free from unjust interference by ISPs. This bill restores the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order, released four years ago today, as luck would have it, and it, and it brings back the three bright line bans on blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. But it does more than that, and that's a good thing. It restores the FCC's whole decision that adopted those rules, put them on the bedrock of Title II, and forbore from the parts of that law that we don't need. Restoring the 2015 framework is precisely the right approach on the law and the facts, and it's tremendously popular too. Huge majorities opposed its repeal, 86%, including 82% of Republicans, supported keeping the 2015 rules. So when I hear we can't have the 2015 rules back because we need a bipartisan solution, it reminds me of the Princess Bride line. You keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. This bill restores the FCC's power to make new rules, preventing new forms of ISP discrimination. That's why Section 202 of the Communications Act is crucial. The FCC needs that authority to address any unreasonable discrimination, like AT&T's schemes to favor its own video content and voice services, or Comcast's abuse of interconnection points to slow traffic to a crawl. Provisions like Section 201 are crucial too. It allows the FCC to address unjust and unreasonable behavior, like Verizon slowing down firefighters' data. Those who cynically say that wasn't a real net neutrality violation suggest that the FCC fiddle while forests and homes burn, rather than have the power to protect people's lives and public safety. They also say that Title II is somehow too new and untested, and yet also too old, while claiming, funnily enough, even older antitrust and FTC laws can protect the open internet. Their claims don't add up. The FCC has used the 2015 framework with great success for decades, for internet access, wireless voice, and business-grade broadband, too. When it returned to the right law for net neutrality in 2015, that decision was upheld in the courts twice. Some still say we have no business applying laws written for 1930s monopolies. But what about present-day ones? By 2017, 39% of people in the U.S. still had, at most, one choice for wireless broadband, offering downstream speeds of 25 megabits per second. At 300 megabits per second, that figure is, is 77%. But even if they have a couple of choices, I doubt many constituents back home complain to you that broadband is just so darn affordable and reasonable they'd be glad for no oversight at all. Yet while the Save the Net bill restores the FCC's ability and mandate to watch out for abuses and fraudulent billing, it also locks in the FCC's 2015 decision to forbear from rate setting under Section 205. It also puts the FCC back on solid ground to protect a whole host of broadband rights outside of net neutrality, with provisions like Section 254 offering a solid base for broadband universal service, and Section 224 granting competitive providers access to rights of way. 
and it fixes in place the 2015 order's decision not to apply resale or unbundling obligations in Section 251 that by their own terms do apply to telephone, telephone services alone. In sum, the bill restores not just the fundamental communications rights Internet users need, but the certainty that broadband providers had. That's why they continued to invest and deploy at largely the same pace and on the same trajectories they did before the 2015 vote. New numbers for 2018 show that Chairman Pai's simplistic and silly promises on booming investment after repeal have not panned out. Broadband investments and speeds trend up over time, though spending does come in cycles, and it trends that way for rural carriers too. As my written testimony explains, one witness here last month claimed that he couldn't get a loan or expand his coverage for two years, all because of Title II's supposed shadow. Yet during the first two years of Title II's return, he invested $2 million in fiber and tripled the speeds offered to all of his cable broadband customers in rural parts of Oregon. Thankfully, the Save the Net Act cuts through the clutter of false claims about supposed investment impacts, and it restores all of the rights that Internet users need. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Wood. So we've now concluded opening remarks, and we're going to move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. Let me say to my colleagues that I'm very interested in your questions, uh, but not after they go over five minutes. Uh, so <laughs> I would ask uh, all of our colleagues uh, to get their final ask in before their five minutes. Uh, we will allow the witnesses to answer a question uh, if it goes past there, but uh, let's all respect one another's time uh, as we move forward. And I will start and try to set a good example uh, by recognizing myself for five minutes. Mr. Mr. Wood, this bill would permanently prevent the FCC from enforcing the majority of Title II. Let me say that again for all my colleagues. This bill would permanently prevent the FCC from enforcing the majority of Title II. However, it would keep the prohibition on unjust and unreasonable practices. I want to know why you think this provision is necessary and what are some examples of practices that were not violations of the three bright lines that we all seem to agree on uh, that limits blocking, throttling, and paid, prioritiz uh, paid prioritization. Uh, what are something outside the three bright lines that would be a violation of unjust and unreasonable standards and why we need that section in the bill? Thank you, Chairman Doyle. I, I mentioned the firefighter example. I think that one cries out for attention. Uh, it was not necessarily a throttling violation under one of the bright line rules because Verizon was not throttling content coming into the firefighters. It was basically slowing them down no matter what they were doing with their service. So the unjust and unreasonable standard in Section 201 actually couples with the non-discrimination standard in 202 and would apply in situations like that. It would apply to fraudulent billing practices or other sort of price gouging that ISPs might engage in not with the FCC deciding what rates providers should charge, but having at least some oversight of that uh, rate making that the providers do for themselves. Mr. Green, uh, at our last hearing, we heard from another small ISP about how open Internet rules hurt investment in his network. Uh, I'm curious, did the 2015 rules uh, or FCC oversight hurt your ability to get financing or impact your investment in any way? Uh, and has a potential investor ever declined to invest uh, because of net neutrality rules? No. We have, uh, in fact, had great success with net neutrality rules. Um, the discussion maybe comes up once in a while because it's so public, but uh, I actually sit on the board of uh, an organization, uh, Northwest Washington, <coughs> excuse me, Northwest Telecommunications Association. I'm very familiar with the member uh, that you're referring to, the ISP. Um, we certainly, uh, I certainly have a position and disagree with the, the opinion that is any way uh, deterred any investment into our sector by, by any such imagination. So we have had great success since the Invest the Act in 2015. Thank you. Ms. Ocillo, are you concerned that based on Chairman Pai's Restoring Internet Freedom Order that millions of Lifeline subscribers could be at risk of losing access and does Save the Net Bill put Lifeline program on a firmer legal footing? Um, thank you for that question because um, I didn't have time to focus on Lifeline in my opening statement, and it's one of the programs that my organization is most passionate about. Lifeline is the only federal telecom 
subsidy for people who are in need to actually get connections to both broadband internet um, via phone or um, wireline phones at home. And I think that it's important for us to recognize that Title II is where the actual authority for FCC to have those types of universal service plan plans comes from. Um, I think that this bill is something that we need. I think that it's important for the FCC to have express authority to do universal service programs like Lifeline and the others that are funded through the USF program. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, tell me, um, how does Save the Net bill help your business, and, and do you feel that it balances appropriate net neutrality rules with regulatory certainty uh, that you need to conduct your business? And, and I'm just curious, are you comfortable with the obligations that the Save the Net bill would put on you as well as the way that it preserves the integrity of the product you sell access to, an open Internet? Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Doyle. I, um, very much a proponent of save the internet. I think that it gives us all the protections, and I don't just mean a few, I mean all of the protections that are necessary, such as interconnection, uh, enforcement, and conduct. So I very much support save the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with 45 seconds left on my time, I'm going to yield back to set a good example for the rest of our colleagues, and I am now going to uh, ask my friend and ranking member, Mr. Latta, uh, you have five minutes to ask questions. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and again, thanks to our panel witnesses for being with us today. Mr. McDowell, if I could uh, start my questioning uh, with you. My concern with reinstating Title II is that the broad authority it provides would open the door to intrusive government regulation that has nothing to do with net neutrality. Will you answer uh, yes or no to the whether Title II could lead to the following scenarios? The government setting prices. Yes, Title II could. The government determining what services ISPs could offer consumers and whether and how they could be bundled. Yes, Title II does that as well. The government directing where ISPs put their investments and how much they should earn. Title II has that authority, that power, yes. The government dictating how parts of the Internet should be interconnected and on what terms? Yes. The government requiring ISPs to share networks they built with private capital? Yes, same, same answer. Okay. Let me move on. I want to clarify something from Mr. Wood's testimony, uh, uh, contrary to his argument before 2015, the FCC had never classified broadband internet access under Title II. I'd like to introduce for the record a letter you wrote uh, back in May of 2010 to then uh, Chairman Henry Waxman, uh, which explains how the FCC issued a series of order orders, all without dissent, that classified all broadband services as information services. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer that for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McDowell, will you explain to us why it is a myth that broadband was regulated under Title II? So as I outlined in that letter, which is almost nine years old, uh, but the history remains the same. So you can go back to the 1996 Act when Congress had a chance to uh, make a distinction between enhanced and basic services, which it did. So think of enhanced services as advanced services or computer-to-computer -computer communications. Uh, going back to the computer inquiries at the FCC, so is there storage forwarding processing of data? Is there something, some other service other than a pure transmission service? Um, so Congress looked at that in 1996, um, and then uh, the FCC in 1998, uh, pursuant to the prompting of uh, Senator Ted Stevens, issued what we call in the vernacular the Stevens Report. So this was um, the Clinton, second, second Clinton term, uh, and uh, this was Chairman Bill Kennard of the FCC which looked at uh, the emerging uh, broadband or internet access space, which became broadband, um, and concluded that um, those services, uh, internet access services, were rightly in uh, Title I. Where this gets confusing, uh, or sometimes gets deliberately conflated, is uh, what do you do about the underlying transmission facilities if they are owned or operated by a carrier that is otherwise uh, providing Title II services. So the transmission facilities, especially during the implementation of the 1996 Act, Section 251 and other sections, uh, were under Title II. Uh, folks often point to a GTE, the GTE ADSL order of uh, 1998 as well, saying, aha, that was the FCC classifying um, internet access as a, as a 
telecommunications or Title II service. It's not the case. The FCC did not reach that conclusion there. That was about a tariff, uh, again, of the underlying transmission component of uh, DSL or ADSL services by GTE at the time. So there's a lot of confusion there. It gets very technical very fast, both legalese and engineering involved. But suffice to say that internet access services have never been classified as common carriage. They've always been classified as an information service, or in the old days we called those enhanced services. Okay, in my last minute, uh, what concerns uh, did you have about the 2015 rule, so-called general conduct standard, and are there consumer-friendly services that could be prohibited under that standard? So the general conduct standard in the 2015 Title II order allowed uh, the FCC to basically roam around uh, the internet ecosphere so long as it could tether its decision to broadband. Um, it was certainly untested in the appellate courts, but it was very open-ended. I think it would have led to a lot of appeals. And keep in mind that you know, Title II, just sections 201 and 202, um, have been appealed uh, in the courts hundreds of times and within the FCC thousands of times. Um, and so that general conduct standard actually uh, took the leash, uh, con Congress's leash, off of the FCC's jurisdiction and would let it uh, regulate um, as it saw fit until an appellate court put it back inside some boundary. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I have 10 seconds left. I, I will yield back <laughs> my time. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just note for the record uh, that all of the questions that uh, the ranking member asked of Title II, uh, with the exception of the interconnection question, uh, was accurately answered by Commissioner McDowell, uh, except that those are all the sections of Title II that are not part of this bill. Uh, so I would note that for the record. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Well, I thank the chair. I thank the witnesses. Uh, it's a good hearing. It's a good subject. Uh, my district does care strongly about net neutrality protections. When the FCC moved to repeal net neutrality, more than 8,000 of my constituents reached out to me to express their concerns. So I held a town hall meeting on net neutrality. I heard from a veteran. I heard from a librarian. I heard from students. And I heard from a small business owner about their concerns, what this would do to their, uh, to their interests. Um, Mr. McDowell, thank you for your service as a commissioner, as a chairman. You were an FCC commissioner when the agency issued its first net neutrality enforcement action in 2008. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. And you dissented from that action and issued a statement. Is correct. That right? I'd like to, um, I have a copy of your statement. I'd like to submit that for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. McDonald, I also have a copy of the dissent you filed when the FCC did adopted the, 10, uh, the 2010 Open Internet Order. Can you confirm that you dissented? Yes. All right, I'd like to submit a copy of that for the record as well. Thank you. Without objection. Um, and you sat down for an interview with the Wall Street Journal in 2017. Uh, can you confirm that you sat for an interview on this subject in 2017? I may have. I don't, I've had many interviews. I'm okay. sorry to say I don't remember the specific one you're talking about, but, but for, the, for the sport of it, yes, let's say that. But I have, I have that. a copy of that, and I'd like to submit <laughs> that uh, for the record without objection. Without objection. So while I appreciate your willingness to engage on the issue and your suggestion that perhaps some rules are appropriate, I have to wonder whether you're truly interested in any safeguards to protect the free and open Internet. In, 20, in 2008, you claimed that net neutrality issues may be better left to non-governmental internet governance groups. In 2010, you said that net neutrality would cause irreparable harm to broadband investors and consumers. In 2017, when talking about net neutrality, you said it's hype. My constituents don't think it's hype. And the broadband market is competitive as is. It seems like the only time you've agreed with the government actions on net neutrality was the FCC's 27 order repealing protections. Given your repeated opposition to net neutrality, it's hard for me to see that your critiques of our bill are anything more than a tactic meant to delay or halt efforts at giving Americans and my constituents critical online protections. Am I, can I address, is that a question? Sure, no, okay. it's not a question, so, but you can, Respond for Real quick, I, in observance of your time. So in 2008, uh, that was an attempt to enforce the principles uh, as rules, and I objected on that basis that they were not rules. The appellate court agreed with me and struck it back and turned it back to the FCC. In 2010, 
I thought the FCC had overreached. You're right, I, don't, I didn't think that rules are necessary because there are other laws already on the books that I talk about in my opening statement uh, that gave us this wonderful inter internet ecosphere that we enjoy today. But I also thought the FCC overstepped its bounds and didn't explain itself well. And the appellate court largely agreed with me regarding the 2010 order. So in both of those cases, that's true. Um, when it comes to today and having this sort of Damocles uh, swing back and forth every two to four to eight years, and we've learned that surprise elections do happen, so we don't know what's next. Uh, can we get a bill through the House that would get 60 votes in the Senate? I think that's a big question for this committee today. All right. Um, thank you for your response to that. Um, Mr. Wood, what do you think about Mr. McDonald's critiques of pa past FCC efforts to give consumers open internet protection? Well, he's obviously right that those attempts failed in court in 2010 and then 2014, but that was because those rules weren't grounded in Title II. So I think the Save the Net Act neatly solves that problem by permanently grounding the rules in the right part of the law and doesn't leave it pr prone to challenges from ISPs like Comcast and Verizon who went in and sued and had those rules knocked down. I also don't see the sort of Damocles that he's talking about because as Mr. Green testified and as our uh, research shows, investment has trended along just fine. Well, I'm gonna follow up on that a little bit. Would you, uh, would the proposed legislation give ISPs both large and small certainty in opening up uh, in investment? I believe so, yes. I think that's what the record shows. They've continued to invest on the same path and trajectory that they did before 2015 during the Title II period and then since it's been repealed. Do you have any estimates for how much investment might be have been made? Well, I mean, the last page of our written testimony has some current aggregate figures. Uh, it tends to be, on the aggregate, about 70 or $80 billion a year, but we think those figures are actually somewhat uninformative because we look at individual companies and we see that they're investing at about the same percentages they have been for the past decade or more. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'll give you four seconds. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair now recognizes the full committee ranking member, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks for this hearing. Uh, Mr. Mr. McDowell, a quick question for you. Um, would Section 201 allow the FCC to do basically everything Mr. Latta asked you that could be done? Section 201 is a very powerful statute that's been litigated both administratively and the appellate courts many times, and the, the power of tower, uh, t uh, 201 is very broad and powerful. So the FCC could basically, the, the questions Mr. Latta asked, Yes, 201 and, and 202, by the way, is it's a uh, necessary cousin as well. Yeah. <laughs> necessary cousin. That's an interesting phrase. Um, <laughs> and so this legislation would not preclude the FCC from using its Section 201 and necessary cousin 202 to engage in all the things Mr. Lado expressed. Not concerned. in my opinion. They could do a rulemaking and do that. That's what it appears. Okay. Mr. Green, um, I'm curious about Fat Beam. Are you principally a business-to-business -business Internet service provider? Uh, thank you for asking. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, we do deliver indirectly or directly and indirectly residential services. As so, well. what percent of your business is residential versus business to business? Uh, I, would I was looking at the website and it really seems to be marketing more to business to business uh, schools, hospitals. Th yeah, we, I would say uh, that probably less than 12% 12, 12 of our Less than 12% is residential. So, very little of your business would actually fall under the Title II regime, then, right? Uh, not necessarily. With, we, we have edge providers and other providers that would lease facilities from us. But so, but the edge yeah, providers aren't covered under they, Title They are two. not. Do you think they right. should be? I'm sorry? Do you think they should be? They should not be. Okay. So it's okay for them to throttle and block and, and do that sort of activity that they do as well, part of their business plan. Th they have a different set of rules that they Yes, they do, them. don't yes, they? they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then I want to go to uh, Mr. Wood's testimony. Um, which uh, I've, I've been through. And I, I see you spent a, a very incredible amount of time uh, trying to rebut the witness we had from my district the other uh, hearing, uh, Mr. Fennell on page 25 and all. And so we had the opportunity last night to share your testimony with Mr. Fennell. When, when did you, did you reach out to Eastern Oregon Telecom? Uh, no, after the hearing, we published a piece about that, and I understand. Right, but my question, a it. simple question, did you email them? Did you talk to them? No, we relied on public and news reports about investment right. at the time and FCC data as well. Yeah, that's why I was concerned about your testimony, why I raised the issue about, you know, how witnesses should behave here. Because Mr. Fennell's testimony, he, he sent us a letter, and I want to read from it, just part, and I'll submit it for the record without objection, Mr. Chairman. 
Without objection. Uh, he, he says, in part, he, he goes through what really happened here in detail, and I'll make sure you see it, um, because he, he, he basically rebuts what you're saying and says, Mr. Wood's assertions are simply put ill-informed and unfortunately tell a story far different and then in parens and not accurately from the one that actually occurred here in Eastern Oregon. Had Mr. Wood simply picked up the phone or emailed, I would have helped him so that his testimony could be a complete representation of the facts. And he points out that um, his deployment was limited in scope due to a lack of available cash, ultimately only resulting in us building out to about 700 homes in Hermiston. The loan we secured to do the build was obtained prior to the open internet order and had to be guaranteed by Umatil Electric Co-op. Sadly, the project scope that we had hoped for was significantly limited due to a lack of capital. And then he said, in response to Mr. Wood's second bullet on page 25 is written testimony, we obtained a cable system at zero dollars through RFPs from Boardman, Irrigan, Umatilla, and unincorporated in northwest Umatilla County, as they had been abandoned by their previous owner. We originally activated them with DOC SIS 2.0 cable modem termination system, CMTS, bought on eBay. They allowed us to provide download speeds up to 30 megs. Uh, we upgraded the system to 3.0 systems in 2016 using Huawei distributed CMTSs using cash organically generated. This new and extraordinarily cost-effective upgrade now allows us to offer speeds up to 100 uh, megs to home. And so there's more to the story than what your testimony uh, gives this committee. And it's, it's um, I, I think, unfortunate that uh, you didn't actually reach out and, and do the rest of that, of that look. Um, Mr. McDowell, so um, for what part of the Internet's life and flourishing uh, occurred under the Wheeler order of net neutrality? Uh, well, most everything up until February of 2015, so pretty much everything we know today. And then that order was repealed when? That order was uh, voted on December 14th of 2017. I think it became effective last summer. So, and I know I'm out of time here, Mr. Sharon, but basically two years of the Internet's lifespan was under the Wheeler order. Yes, the Internet was not born in February of 2015. I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Loebsack for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to thank Chairman Doyle and Pallone and Ranking Members Ladd and Wallen for having this hearing today. And I thank the witnesses for your participation as well. Uh, net neutrality, obviously, is a very important issue for this committee, I think, for the country. Uh, and I'm really glad that we're taking action today, or at least beginning that process. Uh, as a representative of a rural district, I think net neutrality comes down to being pretty similar in many of the challenges that face rural Americans. That's the challenge of access as much as anything. <laughs> rural Americans, I think, are often left behind when it comes to access to infrastructure and having many of the same opportunities as those living in the coast, on the coast, or in urban areas. Um, I know that's a constant refrain uh, from me here on this committee and others on this committee as well. Um, I have been a constant advocate before this committee for rural communities in my southeast Iowa district, about 12,000 or so square miles. It's very rural, um, and broadband in particular, uh, because expanding access for all Iowans is one of the biggest challenges for my district, as it is for many of the folks on the districts of the folks on this committee. And the hard truth is that for many of my constituents, it's not a question of where if service is being throttled or blocked, but whether there's reliable service, if any, uh, at all. And, and so that's a really important aspect of what I'm interested in, is just making sure that we have the service and access to the good quality service across my district. And open internet principles, I think, are an important part of that conversation as we consider the larger tech and internet environment facing us out there. Our responsibility is to make sure that Americans have reliable service everywhere, and we do need to make sure that that access isn't being unfairly blocked or slowed down or, or degraded. So I do want to turn to some questions, and I apologize. I had to step out briefly, so I think, I think my friend um, Mr. McNerney may have, may have addressed the issue of investment, and I apologize for not being here to, to hear your answers. But I do want to talk about that because, you know, we've talked about the time frame here when we had the open internet order, when it was repealed, when, it, when the repeal went into effect, and then here we are now. Um, when it comes to investment, Mr. McDowell, uh, how did the open internet order affect investment? And I really would like you to be specific about that as well. Absolutely. So if you look uh, in the record at the FCC, uh, filings made by the Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, we call them WISPs. Mm -hmm. um, 
and these are often mom and pop uh, operations in rural areas, including in Iowa. Uh, about 80% of their members, they said in comments to the FCC, uh, had trouble getting financing or loans. I'm, I'm delighted Mr. Green's company hasn't had that problem. And so there may be better cases than others. But for these, these are the smallest of the small ISPs. And when, so when specifically did this happen and for what length of time? From the time of the uh, Title II order in 2015 mm -hmm. uh, onward, that they were having trouble raising money because they would get questions. It, same with the American Cable Association, ACA. They filed in the record uh, that there were uh, many of their members having trouble fi getting financing, and did you uh, say as well as municipal the, broadband companies. Did you say it was a survey of the small providers that, that you said 70 or 80 percent of them are having trouble? So that's the WISPAs said about 80 percent of their members were having trouble. And that was that's a survey that was done of them, is that correct? Right. Then and when was that survey done specifically? After the 2015 title But support. can you tell me when specifically? Between 2015 and into 2017 when uh, the FCC was collecting comments. I'm, for, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a former social scientist, so I, I like to be precise about when things were done. Yep. If you could provide that information to, to me in sure. writing, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. I'd like in the to FCC's know those record, would be happy to get it to you. That'd be great. Same with the ACA filing. Right. Same with the 19 municipalities that said the same thing. Same right. with the independent Wall Street analysts who really have no dog in the fight. They said the same thing, that this okay. is affecting... Uh, mainly because there's so many questions being asked. Right. Uh, and I, you know, part of what I do is I uh, help investors understand Washington, which is no easy task sometimes. And, and, I, and I the really, number of questions I get are I, not. I really hate to cut you off, but I have a limited amount of time, and i got to ask some okay. other folks. Thank sure. you so much. Uh, Mr. Thank Green, you. would you like to respond to that? Please. Please do. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not had any difficulty. Uh, in fact, uh, we have had great success uh, in terms of getting financing. Um, I, I would say that the stability of net neutrality in 2015 even helped more. Right. I, 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 would, I would view it in that in those terms if I mm. could. Well, thank I you. I hope that's specific enough for you. And maybe you could give me some specifics in written form if you would, and I have 17 seconds left. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wood, uh, I'd like you to answer that question too, and then whatever you, more you'd like to say beyond the time here, I'd like to see that in writing and respect the, the rules of the committee here. Sure, well, we do have some of that information in our written testimony. We had some in our previous testimony too. Uh, I don't think there are very many specifics in what Commissioner McDowell gave you, with all due respect. It, Wisp said they had trouble getting financing, what we look at, and what we looked at for Eastern Oregon Telecom and also five other ISPs who came to the FCC in December 2017 and said they had had trouble as well, was we look at their deployment data that they file with the FCC, and we look at the investor reports that the publicly traded providers make to the SEC. What we see there are companies basically investing at the same level. Uh, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down, but that's because of their upgrade cycles, not because thank of any you. impact of the rules. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging my going over the time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have you all here. Um, um, Mr. Green, I, I just want to make a point. Uh, I did colleague one time. One time I had a colleague and I, we voted differently. Then he went on to explain to the media why he thought I voted the way I did. Um, obviously, I went to meet with him on the floor, and I said, I will define how I vote, not you. I would caution you uh, to comment and direct analysis of other people's business models. Um, and uh, when the small providers in my district think that this is going to be harmful, um, and that's just a cautionary note because uh, – Speak to your own business model. Don't, don't speak to any other business model that you may or may not know who they're serving, how they're serving, and why they're serving it. Um, Duly noted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wood, we talked last time, and I brought up, so Adam Kinzinger, our colleague here, is a National uh, Air Reserve pilot, flew two weeks on the southern border. Uh, my friends on, on the Democrat side want smart technology on the wall, the southern border. Part of that is National Guard deployment, and that's kind of what Adam was doing. The panel last week um, all agreed with Mr. Wheeler, who highlighted in his order uh, that that ensured the protection for smart wall protections. All but one witness in the last panel, which was you and, your, and the free press action, were opposed. Um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to correct the record if you're okay with that sort of prioritization 
since the smart wall is a proposal from my friends on the Democrat side. Thank you, Congressman. I, I think if I remember the question, it was about whether we supported two things, funding for a wall or for some new sort of... No, it was on smart wall technology and prioritization. Right, so the answer on prioritization, to stay away from the, the wall for a second, is that... Well, it's kind of defined the same. I mean... Right. Well, as I testified that's last... part year, of the debate of... One part of it is a smart wall. Right. Smart technology, using electronics. And so I, I don't want to... But what I testified to last year, sir, was that prioritization of public safety services is allowed. I don't know if the question was posed in a way that uh, got people to answer with their opinions on the wall. We don't support the building of any no, wall. No, I'm just we talking about the smart wall, technology. So the under the so 2015 rules, prioritization of public safety services is definitely allowed. What's not allowed is charging the public so safety you, officials so you for that privilege. So I think if I hear what you're saying is prioritization for public safety is, access, is allowable. That's not defined as paid prioritization under the rule. Well, it is prioritization. Sure. Right, but paid okay, prioritization. Paid is an important <laughs> word there, sir. It is prioritization. That's right. Okay, thank it you. It could be if it's necessary. It is pay. It is pri prioritization. Let's go back, and I just do this because Anna Ash and I, we're only in the 911 space. Um, this is not broadband, but this is FirstNet. FirstNet's premise is based upon prioritization. Companies use a system, and then if they're, yeah, the answer is it is, and, it, and if there is a need, they push everybody off to allow first-line responders to use that. Let me go to uh, uh, Mr. McDowell. Um, search engines provide content to consumers on the internet. When a consumer searches for content, do search engines prioritize the ads that are served to the consumers based upon paid prioritization? They do, based on an algorithm, yes, absolutely. So this is, to Mr. Woodward, this is actually where paid prioritization occurs. It's paid prioritization all throughout the economy, and it actually can be very efficient. So, in and, your and consumers want it in many cases. It's anti-competitive paid prioritization that is the problem. So we shouldn't conflate the two, right? So in your communication uh, and co conversations, I was down for the health sub gavel um, to Mr. Walden. Uh, you said edge providers play by a different set of rules. Mr. Green. So what, what, what are those different set of rules? Well, first of all, well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, the provider, as an infrastructure provider and ISP, we're a transport company. No, I'm talking about edge providers. Yeah. This is your... I'm here to respond. Your, that, that's not what we do. We, I know, but you... So I want to know what... Since you know edge providers play by different rules, I mean, that's your statement you just made, Correct. what are they? Correct. I'm not an attorney. I don't. I don't make those rules. But but you are the one who said edge providers play by different rules. So what are those different rules? Well, the rules are different. We are <laughs> communicate. Okay, I got that. Yeah, yeah. we're communicating. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Okay, thank you. <laughs> They're governed under a different set of rules than ISPs are. Is what I think he was. Well, if you allow me to respond, he's the one who defined that, and then he wouldn't answer the question. I think I think he responded appropriately. Okay, uh, who's next? Chair recognizes Mr. VC for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, before asking my questions, I just want to clarify. I know that the gentleman that just finished asking questions said that he didn't want his uh, thoughts interpreted wrongly. Uh, and so I don't want us to call each other names on the committee either. I think he said Democrat Party, which is a kind of a Republican operative type word, and it's the Democratic Party. So if he's going to refer to us, he ought to refer to us correctly if he doesn't want his thoughts being interpreted uh, the wrong way. Uh, I wanted to ask Ms. Ocello um, a question because you mentioned the Lifeline program, which I think is a very important discussion that needs to be had uh, in this entire uh, debate. Uh, and when you, when you start thinking about the Lifeline program and who it serves, which is a lot of the constituents in the district that I represent, uh, I wanted to, to ask you, uh, about 50% of Americans with households under $30,000 have broadband. Uh, and uh, as, a, uh, as a good friend of mine that w was very, very wealthy that's passed away now from Texas had said, if, you're, if you make $30,000 a year, and even and, and you don't have to pay one cent in taxes. You probably, especially if you have kids, you probably still don't have any money at the end of the month. And so I wanted to ask you, how do you think that having this service uh, disrupted in any way uh, would undermine the routines of these families that make 
uh, under thirty thousand dollars a year because that's a that's a big number. Yeah, and um, thank you so much, Congressman Beasy. I want to make sure that I frame the background to this because this is, forgive me, this is my first um, hearing, and it's some of what happens that maybe the the tone of the dialogue. People in my home state, they don't care about Democrat or Republican. They don't care about Title II or net neutrality. What they care about is that they have access and that their families can apply for jobs online or that they can apply for scholarships to go to school so that they have a way out of poverty. And when you mention the statistics, um, just to give background, when you're talking about Latino communities, 30% of Latinos do not have access to broadband of any kind. And when you talk about the non-English speaking groups, there, it, that number even goes higher. When you're talking about tribal groups, we have s literally 60% of Americans who do not have access to any broadband. So when there are programs like Lifeline that are fun that are basically their legal foundation is Title II and the FCC has an obligation to connect these disconnected people, that is life or death for some of them. The Lifeline program in times of hurricane is what gives people a way out to actually get access to FEMA and make sure that they can fill out their applications. For students, sometimes it's the only way that they can get access to broadband to do their homework. For some families, that's their only opportunity to connect, maybe to apply for jobs or to get health care. So it's so important that we fund not only just Lifeline, but even start being more imaginative about the way that we connect people. Because Lifeline is not enough, but right now it is the only program that's connecting people to telecom services. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And, and you mentioned something very important. Seven out of 10 children do their homework and need broadband access to do their homework now. My son is is one of one of those uh, students. He's in seventh grade, and 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 you and much of the homework that he does is required. And most of the kids at his school are on free and reduced lunch. They have to have this program. Uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Wood a question. You know, one of the things that happened uh, by the FCC chair was that he reversed a decision made by the previous chair that allowed nine uh, uh, new. Uh, uh, providers of Lifeline into the program. Uh, of course, most of the people that offer this Lifeline, they are resellers. They're not a lot of the big companies that we know about. Can, can you please just sort of touch on very briefly uh, by taking the competition out by the, by the current chair, removing the competition, uh, and making it harder for these new uh, providers to or resellers to provide Lifeline, what, what that's done to the entire program and what it's done to undermine it. Yes, sir, thank you for the question. I think that's a great follow-up to the last one. As you said, uh, one of the consequences of this FCC's fight against Title II and the sound basis it provides for universal service was that they tossed out of the Lifeline program nine providers who are either already providing or willing to provide a broadband-only service. And so what they've done is by getting a, a rid of Section 254 and also swearing off Section 706 of the Telecom Act as a source of authority, they have said, well, if existing providers, if the existing phone company wants to provide broadband, that's fine. They can use USF money for that. Uh, they really have no way to require them to provide that service. And in fact, as you noted, when a company wants to only provide broadband and not a telephone service historically, they may not even be eligible for that lifeline or any other universal service funding. So we think that's a problem for keeping out new entrants, new entrants and innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're back. Thank you. Who's next? Chair now recognizes Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to our witnesses. A very special welcome to Chairman McDowell. My wife, who I've been married to for 25 years, is a Duke Blue Devil. And just like you, she'll never buy another pair of Nike shoes because our star, his shoes blew apart, Zion Williamson, gets the arch rivals North Carolina 30 seconds into the game. He'll be back. Don't worry. Okay, that's off my chest. <laughs> I'm very concerned about returning to the so-called Wheeler title tool rule. Uh, we keep playing ping pong with net neutrality, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That means the market's unstable, it's unsure, and sadly, the majority party had little outreach to us on our side of the aisle, which means this bill will die die in the Senate, it's dead. And so this is just playing messaging and that people who use it need real rules, they need this thing to work. But again, I don't think it's gonna happen with this bill. My question is for you, Mr. McDowell, in the uh, Title II order, the FCC led by Chairman Wheeler recognized 
that sponsored data programs are pro-consumer because they allow consumers to watch and listen to their favorite content without being charged for data. All right, but the FCC also put them under the, quote, general conduct standard, end quote, and open up, quote, bureau investigations, end quote, into companies who offer these pro-consumer plans under the vague general conduct standard. How does the threat of these investigations impact the company's decision when looking to innovate with the internet? So what that does is create an atmosphere of what we call ex-ante regulation, which is before the fact, uh, or mother may I. So before uh, an innovator wants to do something, uh, they were having to go to the FCC to make sure it was okay to do that. If, other than you know, just trying to experiment in the marketplace and say, here's a, a sponsored data plan or zero rating and things of that nature, uh, which were, are very popular with consumers. Um, and so that slowed down innovation uh, and the rollout of uh, some experimentation that uh, consumers ended up liking. And to follow up that question, uh, since the FCC restored the longstanding Title I classification in May of 2017, ISPs are no longer being scrutinized for every pro-consumer innovative offering they might introduce to the market. What innovations do we have now today that we might not have had we let the general conduct standards still be in effect and specific examples of what this bill may do once again? So what's interesting about this debate is sometimes we don't know what does not make it to market because it didn't make it to market, right? So now we do have a, a, an environment where there, there can be experimentation of things like zero rating or, or uh, sponsored data so long as it's not anti-competitive. And I think the word anti-competitive has to be part of this conversation because there's the Federal Trade Commission Act, the Clayton Act, the Sherman Act, common law tort law, common law contract law, and other things. If there were uh, violations of any of those, there would be uh, investigations by the Federal Trade Commission, and there have been some over the years uh, in this space. Uh, so it, it's important to, to make sure when we talk about either discrimination or the offering of services, uh, is it competitive or anti-competitive? Is it pro-consumer or not? And that's really the litmus test. Any specific examples of how a business might have stepped out because of concerns about the Wheeler rule, just all these big So there, there were um, some uh, offerings such as uh, Ben John uh, by T-Mobile, which was held up uh, for a while while the FCC investigated, and that's now a, a thing in the marketplace, a very popular uh, service offering, uh, which is not anti-competitive. It's uh, pro-competition, it's pro-consumer, and consumers seem to love it. And competition drives prices down, encourages innovation. It's just good, good, good. The free market works, works, works. Mr. Chairman, I'll bank 45 seconds. I thank the gentleman. Chair now uh, yields to Mr. McEachin, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for um, pulling this hearing together today. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I am a new member on this committee. I'm also a forming lawyer, and what that means, or what I hope that means, is that I am not necessarily burdened by the knowledge of the past since I wasn't here for a lot of it, but I'm also intrigued by the past. And last month, um, Chairman Wheeler really captured my imagination and my attention when he discussed the fact that we're really dealing with 600 years of English common law or English jurisprudence. 600 years of that, and for some reason, some of my friends the other, the other side of the aisle want to just toss it out of the window and forget it ever happened. Mr. Wood, based on building on Mr. or Chairman Wheeler's testimony, would you please speak to the importance of carbon carrier protections to the openness of what is the most powerful technology in this era? Uh, certainly, Congressman, thank you for the question. I, I think you're exactly right. Common carriage law is a time-honored tradition, but it's one that's still vital. I think the big difference that we're not hearing about so far in this hearing is the difference between common carriage law and antitrust law or other consumer protection statutes. And that is that common carriage law and the Title II foundation for the net neutrality rules that we look to restore here protect everybody's speech on the Internet. Uh, so a common carrier cannot discriminate against their individual users, and they're not just uh, prohibited from interfering with competition, but with any free and open use of the transmission capacity that they sell. And so that's why I think it is true that, yes, the big edge providers do play by a different set of rules, as we've heard, 
but they are speakers, they are publishers, they are aggregators, they are users on the edge of that common carrier network. There could be some debate to be had about which the, of those companies uh, are transmitting speech. I don't think th we have the answer to that right now, but th what we do know is we need common carriage law to preserve that open transmission pathway that we've had for decades and even centuries on many of these infrastructures you're talking about. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up, how does the Save the Internet Act ensure the important, important aspect of common carrier law are kept in place while amending those that need to be omitted because they're outdated? Well, it does that, sir, by restoring the provisions that the FCC kept in the 2015 order, and that does include Title I, or, excuse me, Section 201 and 202, uh, what we said, the necessary cousins, is that the phrase we're using? I wouldn't say those are, that's a bad thing. That, for me, that's a feature, not a bug. I don't think most internet users or most of your constituents are worried about Comcast hands being tied or AT&T's or Verizon's. What they want is somebody to be able to step in and act as a watchdog when a company does abuse those kinds of privileges that they can take under the current lack of any rules. And so you talk about zero rating. In my testimony, I cite uh, examples of research saying that zero rating actually makes costs go up for wireless users. There may be no such thing as a free lunch, and when these wireless companies say, we will put a data cap on you, but then we'll exempt you for some of those purposes, that to us doesn't sound like a great deal. What we have seen in the market since the 2015 rules came into place, not just because of them, but thanks to them and thanks to other developments, is we've seen a return to unlimited data on wireless programs and wireless carrier service offerings. So we actually think that giving people the data they pay for and letting them use it for what they want is a good thing and not something to be worried about. In fact, it's exactly what we all need. And uh, thank you for that, and, and thank you to all of our witnesses. Today, high-speed internet services are intimately tied to social mobility, economic quality, and community growth. As such, we must ensure that access to internet services remain open and not dependent on one's ability to pay. The Save the Internet Act does just that. I look forward to it becoming law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll yield you a whole minute, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize Mr. Flores for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, witnesses for joining us today. Um, in a letter that I'd like to submit for the record, the chairman of the Vermont Telephone Company, or VTEL for short, notes the very direct connection between its investments and the light touch that the FCC reinstituted in 2017, and that VTEL would not have made the decision to invest millions of dollars on Ericsson 4G, 5G upgrades in the absence of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McDowell, um, Ms. Ochea, Ocello, I'm sorry, uh, talked about the digital divide, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Mr. McDowell, what impact would Title II classification have on broadband investment when it's needed most to close the digital divide? Well, as we've seen, and we can debate, but as we've seen in the FCC's record and the record of the hearing here a few weeks ago as well as today, uh, there are a lot of rural carriers uh, in particular, not this isn't just a rural issue, um, uh, who felt as though uh, their ability to raise revenue to build out for mainly residential uh, consumers uh, was, was impaired by the Title II regime. Um, but overall, let's keep in mind that the FCC has an $8 billion universal service fund, and under that umbrella are a lot of other funds. Right. Uh, and Lifeline was one that I defended uh, uh, vociferously when I was at the commission. I was worried about its fiscal uh, long-term health uh, in 2012. But we also expanded um, the support of universal service to broadband, to advanced services, which, right. by the way, Section 254 allows for. And I know if uh, Congressman Pickering were testifying today, because he helped write 254, uh, he would agree with that. Um, so in the fall of 2011, we actually had a unanimous bipartisan decision, the only one of its kind in FCC history, uh, to expand uh, universal service support to broadband. Uh, and ultimately to, to the lifeline recipients as well. So that's a huge component of this. Sometimes the market does not work for everybody, and that's what the Universal Service Fund is there to, to do. Uh, continuing on the subject, Mr. Wood's uh, written testimony claims that just because small providers continued to invest in their networks while Title II was in effect, that Title II did not hurt them. Uh, the challenge with that is that these investment decisions are made far in advance. How far in advance do you think these decisions are made? They could be sometimes years in advance, but you know, again, I'm going to enumerate, uh, dug through my folder here. There's Gigabit Minnesota, there's Chantel, there's Schurz, there's Sjorbergs, Sjorbor there's CATV Telecommunications. Uh, there are a lot of smaller outfits uh, who filed in the FCC's record 
saying that Title II impaired their, their plans. There are far more smaller uh, companies, ISPs, that said that than, than others. That's right, and I appreciate you helping us make sure we have a holistic record of the investment decisions that were made uh, when Title II was, when the 1930s era uh, statute was slapped on the Internet. Um, and that's important to me because about 90% of the land mass in my district is rural, and I care about closing the digital divide. I'd like to see rural America have just as much access to capital and technology as uh, the, my uh, constituents do that live in urban suburban areas. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're having a messaging bill today instead of uh, one of the three bills that would actually th uh, solve the issues that were, have been complained about, and that's the blocking and throttling and pay prioritization. Uh, and so this bill has no chance of passage, uh, and so I think we'd be better uh, spending our time on something else. Uh, during our hearing a uh, few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to ask former uh, FCC Commissioner Powell about the possibilities of further government intrusion under a Title II regime. Uh, Chairman Powell shared my concern that under Title II, the government could eventually set prices or direct in investment decisions of pri private entities. Looking at the bill that, we're, uh, that we have before us today, um, Mr. McDowell, uh, could some, uh, uh, has the Democrat proposal that we have before us, have they safeguarded against these possibilities of changing prices or regulating prices or investment decisions? I'm sorry if you could repeat the question. Yeah, let me, let me repeat it. Uh, the Democrat proposal today is it's safeguarding against the ability of the FCC to set prices for internet services or to uh, direct the investment decisions of private entities? The, the concern with inviting the Title II beast into your tent is even if you only have a few claws of it in the tent, uh, it's a pretty big and strong uh, beast. So, you know, look, I'm an attorney in private practice. I think there would be tons of appellate work. Uh, I should be all for this yep. uh, selfishly, but I'm not because I know that there'll be tons of appeals. But let me say something real quickly, if I may, that's countercultural, which is actually I have faith in this Congress. I have faith that you can find common ground on this issue. I don't think this is the bill for it, but I think you can do this and you can find 60 votes in the Senate. And I'm not just being naive saying that. Well, I agree with you. And this, this committee has a long history of bipartisanship. Uh, this bill is not that, though. So thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, I'll yield to Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to start by having everybody take a deep breath and exhaling. Uh, I know the stakes are high, but, uh, you know, let's start by a perspective and what this bill is, which is an uh, opening offer uh, as we negotiate these very complex and important rules. We're going to conduct hearings, yes, more than one. This is the Internet, so I think we could have even a half a dozen hearings, and they, that may not be sufficient about the information we need to get. We'll have a markup, so this bill is not just messaging. There'll be an opportunity for amendments. I, for one, am open to amendments, and I'm, we've heard some good ones here today. Uh, the Senate appears to open to negotiate after passing a similar CRA, uh, so this idea that there's no chance of passage is also not true. We were asked by the public to create basic net neutrality rules, uh, and this bill is a start to doing that. In addition, we were asked by industry to create a new chapter uh, and this bill will create a new chapter. Don't you think the internet deserves its own chapter? I mean, it is so all-encompassing. And then we were asked uh, to make sure there was some parity between ISPs and edge providers. And this bill does that through memorandums of understanding. And uh, that was sort of a confusion, so I want to clarify what our staff has explained. Um, by reinstating the 2015 uh, that applies Section 201 and 202 of the Communications Act that creates a standard to prevent unjust and unreasonable and discriminatory network pra practices. This would apply to everyone, edge providers and ISPs. Those were two recommendations uh, from businesses in this space that uh, we are on the road to, to meeting. Uh, but I want to get some consensus on some of the things this bill does. By a show of hands, how many of you are opposed or, or believe this sh bill should uh, give FCC regulation over blocking. Raise your hand if you believe that the FCC should, under this bill, be able to stop blocking. Raise your hand. Blocking by regulated entities, sir, but yes. Okay. And how many of you believe the FCC should have the authority uh, to regulate throttling? Raise your hand. Raise them a little higher. Come on, everybody. You're saying under this bill, is that right? Under this bill. Okay. Okay. And uh, how many of you support 
the FCC having ability to stop paid prioritization. Raise your hand if you support that. Okay. And uh, how many of you believe there should be FCC investigatory power uh, for consumer and business complaints given to the FCC? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, and fines for uh, violations. Raise your hand. Thank you. Um, and I want to personally thank the chairman for um, reviving FCC authority to fund rural broadband and lifeline. Uh, that's important for uh, areas of my district uh, like South Osceola County and Polk County that uh, obviously are really important. Uh, there are a series of concerns that, uh, that Congressman Lotta brought up, which I think we do need to hash out. Uh, m the chairman has already said that setting prices and rates, dictating capital investments has not been part of the bill, is not part of what the intent of this bill is. So Mr. McDowell, if we explicitly put in place exclusions saying that the FCC shouldn't be setting pricing or rates or dictate where uh, ISPs or edge providers have to um, put in their capital, uh, would that make the bill more palatable in your opinion? I wouldn't be able to endorse it. I, I think this Congress can do better than that. I think we can do better than relying on Title II. I think the Internet, to your point, deserves its own chapter, and, and Title II is not the Internet's chapter. But you do agree this isn't the old telephone company model where people have a monopoly and and we would need these pricing rates and that it would greatly improve the bill if there were ex if we were explicit in these two areas if the intent is to fashion something new then let's fashion something new but taking a couple of piece parts of title two isn't the way to go I'd like to give each of our other witnesses uh, give us one suggestion you'd like to see in the bill starting with Miss Ochia um, if I were to add something to the bill uh, I would like to see that the FCC had some sort of um, obligation to actually disclose what, how, their universal, how effective their universal service programs actually are, so they should have an obligation to do so, as well as to um, sh uh, actually create incentives for deployment explicitly. Thank you. Mr. Green. Not some, but all protections. Okay. Mr. Wood. I don't think, Congressman, there's anything to add because we supported the 2015 rules, and we don't think, as I said in my testimony, there are people who do face a monopoly today, but we do have a long track record under Title II with wireless voice and business broadband services where there was no uh, after-the-fact rate regulation for more than two or three decades now at the FCC, so we don't really think that's a, a realistic danger or one that your constituents should fear or would uh, look askance at. Thanks. My time has expired. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. I thank the chairman and thank you to witnesses for being here. Um, a little over one month ago, we sat here in this room, as has been noted, discussing net neutrality. Here we are again, and already over half of the hearings I've attended on this subcommittee have dealt with net neutrality, and it's only March. Uh, the last time around, my Republican colleagues introduced three net neutrality bills to kick off discussion on a potential legislative solution that would preserve congressional prerogative over agencies to which it delegates authority. And unfortunately, it looks like we're going the opposite direction, uh, truly back to 1930s or Ma Bell type regulation that I'm old enough to remember. And I'm glad we're past that in most cases. As legislators, uh, Congress must be clear about what authority the FCC has and does not have when we think they've failed. Uh, this seems to be a clear case where Congress must cut through the uncertainty that is hampering broadband investment in places like my district, a rural district, and not rubber stamp an old commission's decision. Codifying existing commission action doesn't seem to be a serious attempt to legislate this issue as the title of this hearing suggests, and fall short of delivering the expectation of a free and open Internet our constituents desire. I expressed my willingness last uh, uh, hearing to work across the aisle on this issue, um, and I remain willing to have that discussion today. But while I respect the Commission as an expert technical agency over communication issues, I firmly believe that ultimately Congress needs to provide the certainty and clarity that consumers demand. Uh, Mr. McDowell, um, you refer in your testimony to some legislative efforts as zero sum, uh, implying that in order for one faction to win, others must lose. 
Can you explain what parts of this debate are not zero sum? And so in my testimony, I was referring mainly to the regulatory actions at the FCC. So Title II does bring uncertainty. It does bring uncertainty to the investment community, to, to analysts, to the folks making the loans, uh, to Internet service providers. That's just a fact. It's just the case. So that becomes zero sum. So when you bring in Title II and whether the intent is to have the specter rate regulation or not in this particular bill, there will still be questions about that because uh, lawyers uh, will get paid to find the, the maximum path uh, forward uh, of that uh, language as well as others on the other side to, to try to make it as narrow as possible. So uh, zero sum, when you start, starts coming into play when you talk about Title II in this regard. I think that if you were to take Title II off the table and start with some principles, which I think everyone in this room shares, those core principles that I talk about in my testimony, then you have a chance at a large bipartisan majority uh, to, to get through those 60 votes in the Senate so something could actually become law and last for decades. And so following that up, do, does the bill before us today or any other net neutrality legislation like the bills introduced by Republican leaders Walden, Latta, uh, or Rogers incorporate features that are not zero sum that everyone has agreed on? So <clears throat> for you Star Trek fans, there's an old Vulcan saying that says only Nixon can go to China. So let me say this, uh, which is the 2010 SEC order, I think there are many parts of that, uh, which some of which are echoed in the LADA bill, uh, could be uh, the nucleus for some successful legislation. Uh, can each of you down the line, um, starting with Ms. Ochio, um, quickly answer if you think this issue is zero sum? I don't. I don't think this is a zero sum. No. Mr. Green. I don't think my time is running out. I don't think that it's a zero sum. Mr. Wood. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, we all understand the question, sir, but I do think that this is a net positive, is what I would call it, setting the rules uh, straight again and making it certain to people that they can say what they want online and see what they want online without interference by their ISP, but as my testimony shows, with no interference to broadband providers' investment decisions, despite what we've heard today. And I would suggest if that's what we were doing, I could agree with you, but I can't. I yield back nine seconds. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle and my colleagues on this subcommittee for continuing this critical conversation on how we can codify important bright line protections for consumers on the internet while promoting innovation in every corner of the internet ecosystem. Uh, at our first hearing on this issue, it was clear that broad support exists when it comes to making the principles we all care about permanent. Today, I look forward to examining the Save the Internet Act with that same spirit. Everyone on this committee understands the necessity for protecting access to broadband for our communities and our economy. As I've previously said, I want to see a permanent solution that's enforceable, robust, and has lasting protections for consumers and our small businesses. Mr. Green, uh, as someone who represents an incredibly rural district, as I do, uh, I know up in Idaho you have many of those same type of districts. I'd like to thank you for your organization's work in serving rural communities in the western United States, including some in Arizona, with critical access to the Internet. In your experience, how are small businesses in rural communities impacted by a lack of certainty regarding net neutrality rules? Thank you for your question, Mr. Congressman. Um, I, I think that uh, obviously, in the business that we're in is delivering service to a community that is requiring demand. Demand is creating this need. So we are a for-profit business. So I will start with that to try not to take up your time, but I will also say that as we build that business and enterprise network for your business community, surrounding communities, for education, for economic development, we also provide connectivity in and out of that community so that you have access to the internet. Let's just hope that one day a child, someone in college, someone working from home will get a better education, 
let's hope that maybe someone, some young, talented individual will create the next Netflix in a rural market that you live in and you support uh, like Netflix. And that sort of, quite frankly, is really one of our goals. So yes, we are for profit, we're a business. But at the end of the day, if the outcome is that a child can have the same access in your community that they can in New York and any of their markets in the United States, then we've done our job. Uh, that's key. There's nothing bad about for profit. Uh, I think it's a good way to invest in America and invest in the future of America. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of that uh, there's a sentiment within the, our country that uh, rural America is, is kind of, well, they're out there, we know they're out there, but uh, you know, for them to participate is just going to cost way too much money. It's going to not get us where we need to be, and yet at the same time we need everybody in the workforce up to the highest level we can as far as education. We need good health services. We need, we need people to fully understand the connection between our, our entire country, not just parts of our country, at the same level. Uh, and I, I heard some discussion earlier about, well, you're, you're mostly for businesses. Well, if you get into the communities in my area and others can get links to you, uh, then you're for everybody in that community and that's a critical element, and that investment is important to each and every one of those communities. Um, Mr. McDowell, I agree with your statement that uh, the time has come for Congress to provide clarity and certainty by enacting new legislation with regard to neutrality rules. Now, I haven't been here for your entire testimony, uh, and you've brought up a lot of uh, ideas and concepts that I'd like to hear more about, uh, but uh, I also, have, have noted that a lot of what you've talked about is uh, kind of, a, as they would say, in the cloud and that specific to how you personally would like to see this type of a bill uh, address the issues uh, that you do not agree to. Thank you. And first of all, happy early St. Patrick's Day to you. And the same to you. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, as, a, as a starting point, I, I want us to to listen to the Supreme Court from 2005 when it talked about Title II reclassification. It said, Title II reclassification was subject to mandatory common carrier regulation, all information service providers that use telecommunications as an input to provide information service to the public, end quote. That's at US, uh, five, uh, 545 US at 994. Mr. I think that's important. I'm sorry, my time's up and, and we'll get back to it another time. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman Ayo. Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bilirakis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to uh, talk like, uh, again, uh, I know some of the members before asked, but I want to start again with the, this issue. Cle clearly, the FCC needs congressional authority to prevent these huge swings of all, uh, again, of, of all or nothing rule uh, under the Title I or Title II. If we're all in agreement that we must prevent blocking and throttling of service, and I think we are all in agreement, then let's codify those consumer protections uh, and let's do it now in a bipartisan fa fashion. Uh, I believe that's what the people want, in my opinion. What, what I'm afraid of uh, for my constituents is the open-ended forbearance that, uh, 20, uh, that the 2015 order, H.R. 1644, puts in place. Mr. McDowell, under the 2015 order, if the current FCC decides to forbear for a particular Title II regulation, uh, does subsequent FCC leadership have to abide by that decision? Under the 2015 order, no. No? Okay. Okay. Under the current law, internet users are protected from the uh, universal service fee by statute. Is that correct? Uh, c correct, okay. essentially, yes. Okay, essentially, okay. Florida greatly benefits from uh, this protection. So as we're already a payor, so we're a payor uh, state in, into the uh, Universal uh, Service Fund um, and, and do not receive, we don't receive our proportionate share of benefits. That's the case in a lot of matters, unfortunately. Uh, again, Mr. McDowell, if passed, would H.R. 644 remove this protection? 
uh, and, and potentially allow the internet to be subject to USF fees. So the, the 2015 order equated IP addresses, internet protocol addresses with phone numbers. Uh, yep. That not only had implications potentially for universal service, uh, for, for contributions, uh, what I'll call taxation, although that's controversial for me to say that, um, for universal service purposes, uh, but also internationally as well for just international uh, intergovernmental regulation of, of uh, internet services. So uh, there is that potential, again, that when you start talking about Title II, as I was saying earlier, and that's the backdrop, uh, it starts to bring up all of these questions, um, and that's why I think you need to erase the whiteboard and start clean. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, thank Mr. Bilirakis. Let me just say uh, for my colleagues, uh, for the record, that when the Mr. Bilirakis asked if a future FCC commissioner could unforbear uh, the once again, Mr. McDowell correctly answered that under the 215 Open Internet Order, uh, that answer is yes. But under this bill, uh, that answer is no, because this bill puts in statute that forbearance, and only an act of Congress could do that. Uh, who's next? Oh, I see the chairman of our full committee has returned, and, and we yield five minutes to Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, net neutrality is really about the core values that Americans hold dear, free speech, competition, innovation. I wanted to ask Mr. Wood, I know these ideas are important to free, to free press. Can you discuss how the Save the Internet Act would promote free speech and economic opportunity for small uh, businesses and how that compares to the Republican neutrality proposals that we've seen recently? Uh, sure, Chairman Flynn, thank you very much for the question. Uh, we've heard today that the FCC rules could be a sort of mother may I for ISPs. I don't think that's actually true based on the conduct of the FCC. The last thing we want and the reason we're so much in support of these rules is we can't afford a mother may I for American businesses. So what these rules do is they provide that open pathway that people have always had to start a business, to get educational opportunities, to say what they want, to organize for change without having to get the cable or telephone company's permission and that's a good thing. It, it keeps in place the rules we've had, albeit on a shifting legal framework over the course of the past decade and a half. Well, thank you. Ms. Ochillo, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. It is incredibly important to this committee that we help every American be able to afford the incredible power that comes with broadband internet access. And I know making sure more people can access a wide array of material on the internet is key for the National Hispanic Media Coalition. So my questions, uh, can you explain how the Save the Internet Act would help low-income folks get access? And I've heard some say that without net neutrality, poorer Americans will be relegated to second-class status online, only being able to afford junk internet plans. So what do you think about that? How would the, the bill help low-income, and what about uh, without neutrality, what would happen? Uh, would they just get junk plans? To the first part of your question, um, thank you, Congressman. Um, I do want to tie it to something that I said when um, Congressman Soto asked me about what I would add to this. And since we're in the spirit of compromise and talking about things that we can do to make it better, I think that we should think about putting in protections for Lifeline. And specifically, Lifeline, as I've mentioned over and over again, it's one of the only programs that people have to get access to tele telecommunications. And there are no, no, no other federal agency, there's no one who's dreaming up any other programs. Um, to why net neutrality is helpful to people who are um, currently denied access, I think we need to be honest about the fact that when there are, when there is no net neutrality in place, even though it will be hard to detect at first, uh, ISPs are going to slowly start to rise, like prices will eventually start to rise. They're going to start putting in more tolls to access. If they say you have um, a Comcast plan, but you want to have Netflix, you want to have Hulu, it's going to cost you maybe instead of a $10 add-on, it might be 12 And I think that it's important to note that when the net neutrality repeal was announced back in November of 2017, that day, Comcast actually removed from its website its three-year pledge against paid prioritization. Not the paid prioritization that's helpful for safety, but paid prioritization that costs consumers more for the things that they access now. <laughs> 
So I think that we'd be fooling ourselves if we thought that if we just left it to internet companies to regulate themselves, that we wouldn't eventually pay more. Because when the uh, cable companies went and interrupted the broadcast market in the 1960s, they were supposed to be offering new comp competition and diversity and all sorts of things. And 20 years later, they started bundling packages and saying, I think that consumers in this section of the country want to watch X. And I think that you should pay Y because this is what this provider is charging you. So I think that it's just we have to have an honest conversation that eventually that will trickle down to consumers. I appreciate that. And I have one last question for Mr. Green. At our last hearing, we heard some argue that we shouldn't have strong net neutrality protections because they would undermine investments in networks. But I find that hard to believe since we saw the Financial Times report recently that the big four broadband companies invested less in capital projects last year after the repeal of net neutrality protections, undermining the Trump FCC's reasoning for doing away with the rules. So, Mr. Green, in your experience as an Internet service provider, should we believe these arguments that strong net neutrality, like those that the Save the Internet Act would reinstate, would undermine network investment, and why or why not? Demand is driving the investment. It's just the end of the day, it's the economy. If there's demand and there's a need, people like myself and business entrepreneurs will find the capital and the resources to create a return for their investment and compete in a fair marketplace. So you don't think that um, under reinstating the rules under the Save the Internet Act would undermine network investment at all? You don't see that being linked? N no, I do not. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, You're Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Long for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. McDowell, Title II is intended for common carriage networks such as uh, the state-of-the-art telegraph and railroads. But uh, what strikes me is that with each network revolution, the old rules no longer make sense and new rules were needed. That's exactly why we need the 21st century rules for a 21st century service. Not rules from the 1930s for rotary telephone service. From your vantage point, what are the risks of regulating the internet in the same way as common carriers? Thank you, Congressman. So excellent question. So the, you know, the history of common carriage goes back to the idea of natural monopolies, like a canal. You dig a big long ditch, fill it with water, and it's the shortest point between, or distance between point A and point B. Uh, the, tele the telephone system was considered to be a natural monopoly because of the telephone poles and the wire you had to string up, or railroads, again, the shortest point between point, uh, shortest distance between point A and point B. Um, and then that uh, common carriage regulation um, uh, really started with the Interstate Commerce Act of 1889 in our country for railroads and then was applied to airlines and trucking, et cetera. And we saw the 1934 Act, obviously, with the Ma Bell monopoly. Um, but things are different with the Internet. And it was actually during the Carter administration, uh, Jimmy Carter's administration, where a lot of these common carriage statutes and regulations started to be deregulated. So railroads, airlines, trucking, those were all uh, deregulated uh, under uh, the Carter administration. We saw investment go up. We saw transit time go down for the, the transportation uh, sector. Uh, we saw consumer uh, choice go up. Um, so a lot of what is advertised to be the benefits of common carrier regulation, it's actually the opposite. So what does that tell us? That tells us that transit times were slower under common carrier regulation. Prices were artificially higher under common carrier regulation. Consumer satisfaction was lower. They just didn't know it because that was the only choice at the time. So those are some of the problems with common carrier regulation. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Ocello, uh, while you were speaking to <coughs> Chairman Pallone a minute ago, uh, you said, when we're in the spirit of compromise, uh, some others have said compromise and they call it bipartisanship at an earlier hearing. But when we are in the spirit of compromise, do you think attacking people on Twitter is a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, sir, respectfully, I, I don't attack people on Twitter any day of the week, so I don't ever do something like that. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm glad you don't. What happened to my is it on? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, and I'm glad that you don't attack people on Twitter. Uh, Mr. Wood, <coughs> one question comes to mind is free press. Was, I don't know if that was pun intended or not when they named free press, but I have two items that I'd like for free press to respond to. 
on the record, and I know you won't have these figures with you here today, so if you can provide those in writing, I would appreciate it. The first is how many fundraising emails your organization sent regarding net neutrality and the open internet rules within the, in the last two years, and second, how much money Free Press raised through those emails. I want to highlight the fact that Free Press, Flight for the Future, and other groups exist by dividing Congress on this issue. During the February 7th hearing, as soon as a representative from the majority said he or she would like to work on bipartisan legislation, they were from the minority, I think, uh, were immediately attacked by you on Twitter. And you attacked me on Twitter right after that hearing. Attacking people is the only thing free press does where they seem to think they need to operate in a bipartisan fashion where they need Republicans, which is somebody to attack. And I think all members of the committee should be wary when an organization says compromise and bipartisanship is the enemy, especially if their financial interests are involved. And uh, I hope you would follow Mrs. Ocello's lead and quit attacking people on Twitter when we are trying to do things in a bipartisan fashion and, as she says, in the spirit of compromise. I yield back. I guess that wasn't a question, huh? Okay, the gentleman yields back. It, it was a question. I said I'd like for him to respond in writing, so I yield back. Okay, thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes the vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Clark. Five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. I thank our witnesses for their expertise today. And I, I just want to say, I don't know why Ms. Ocello's name was even raised in that last um, piece that you had. Uh, it, it, we should uh, restrain ourselves from um, trying to contrast and compare uh, panelists. It's, 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 not, it's not a good thing. People can get confused from what was being said. Well, the gentlelady yields. I will. I, I didn't intend to cast any aspersions on Ms. Ocello. It, 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 I, it came I across that way, sir. Well, I apologize because she does not. Thank you. I mean, That's I, all I, I needed was the apology. On Twitter. Okay, very well. Do, I, I want her to say I don't attack on well, Twitter. Yeah. I don't think that's a good thing. I, I understand that. But we're in a hearing where we're trying to make sure that the record is accurate. And so I, I appreciate your apology, Mr. Long. Back. Uh, let me get to my questions. Um, so, Mr. Wood, could you remind the committee of some of the historical net neutrality violations we've seen that the Save the Internet Act would actually address? Uh, certainly. Thank you, Congressman Clark. Congresswoman Clark. Uh, there have been several. There were some that happened before the decision that Commissioner McDowell referred to earlier. So one of the most famous ones was Comcast was actually blocking video, not from a competitor, but really from any streaming video source being sent over a file sharing application called BitTorrent. Uh, before that, we saw local phone companies in rural areas blocking Vonage and other VoIP applications. Uh, more recently, we saw AT&T not allow usage of FaceTime on mobile networks unless people were willing to pay more money for that privilege and, in fact, to pay, an unlimited, pay for an unlimited voice plan. So we've seen a lot of these kinds of uh, transgressions, even with the rules in place or principles in place throughout the last decade and a half. That is very well. And um, in your prepared testimony, you described the ability of the Save the Internet Act to protect marginalized community, communities by repealing the 2017 FCC order and returning to the regulatory framework outlined in the 2015 Open Internet Order. Can you expand on the role Title II, Section 202 of the Communications Act plays in protecting marginalized and low-income communities? Uh, certainly. Thank you again. Uh, so what we want to have and make sure that we have is non-discrimination protections for anything someone says, not just for competitors. I think sometimes net neutrality is cast as some sort of battle between Comcast and Netflix or between AT&T and Google. And really what we think it is is a guarantee for every Internet user's rights to see and say what they want online. So we have examples of this. Actually, other services sometimes, Verizon blocked text messages uh, about abortion rights at one point in, in 2000. Uh, seven, I believe, it could have been a year or two off of that, and actually NARAL and the Christian Coalition came together and said, this is the last thing we want. We can't have carriers dictating what we can say to our members. So that was a Title II service uh, at that point in time, or arguably one, in text messaging, and sometimes ISPs will say, why would we block things for political purposes? It's exactly the same kind of decision that we see them making at times. If they think something will be unsavory to their users, they might decide to block it or treat it in a less favorable fashion, and we can't afford that. 
Very well. Um, Ms. Ocello, in your opinion, does it seem reasonable for one of the appro approximately 24 million Americans without access to broadband to file an antitrust suit against a major ISP? Uh, absolutely not. And I do want to point out that NHMC uh, last year pointed out I actually visited a lot of offices um, here on the Hill just to raise that um, the FCC at some point had an ombudsperson who was able to at least receive the open internet complaints and at least help people navigate that process. But in general, consumers don't have any recourse and wouldn't know who to call. Very well. Uh, Mr. Green, can you, there was something in your testimony that you said earlier, uh, I need a little clarification on. Aren't enterprise broadband services, while not under the open internet order, still under the non-dominant carrier title to uh, just as broadband internet access services? Was it Mr. Green? I thought you said Mr. Wood, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Green. It, it, let me repeat. Aren't enterprise broadband services, while not under the open internet order, still under non-dominant carrier title two, just as broadband internet access services. They are. Very well. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I yield back the balance I of my I thank time. the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Ms. Brooks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to Ranking Member Latta, um, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. I apologize I've not been able to be here. I am uh, have been part of a hearing on Select Committee on Modernization of Congress, uh, where technology uh, has been a big part of that hearing, so we've been hearing from members all morning, and it just finished, so I apologize. I, I do feel a little bit like uh, in a bit of deja vu right now, because I feel like we had discussions about this about a month ago, and I, I just want, uh, as members of the committee, to know that I believe all of us support a free and open internet that has proper transparency protections to ensure there's no blocking and throttling. Um, and I know we're uh, debating uh, a, a bill um, that I wish was not partisan, but I, I do wish, and I heard when, I, when the hearing began, we need to end the ping-ponging on this issue, um, and I think the country really is demanding that. Um, but I think right now, as I understand it, the bill that's before us has no chance of really being taken up by the Senate or being signed by the President, so we need to move forward. And one of the reasons we need to be move forward, I'm a co-founder of a 5G caucus here in the House of Representatives, and we've got to stop fighting about this in the country. We've got to get our act together as a country so we're not falling behind the rest of the world and falling around behind uh, many other countries that are going to beat us in this next uh, round of technology uh, called 5G. So I've been proud to work with colleagues on both sides of the aisle on some of these issues. I want to continue to do that. Um, I, I guess I would like to start out, uh, Mr. McDowell, with, and would ask all of you, actually, what impact would, if you were, were to restore the FCC's 2015 open internet rules, have on the likelihood that U.S. will be able to lead the world in the deployment of 5G network and services? Something I think we all need to be very focused on. First of all, congratulations on founding the 5G caucus. I think it's very important. And, and for the record, it founded that with uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, uh, also Congresswoman Annie Custer, and Congressman Tim Wahlberg. So we're going to be focused on this. We have to be focused on this in the, as a country. It's a bipartisan caucus. I encourage my colleagues to join the caucus. Um, but let, let's talk about how what we're talking about could have an impact on our global competition uh, to be a leader in the world on 5G, and I'll start with you. And, and so the U.S.'s uh, uh, leadership on, in 5G is by no means a foregone conclusion. It is not inevitable, and uh, you're right to call that into question. There's a lot that has to be done as we spend maybe $300 billion or more over the next six or seven years as a country to build out 5G. So when you're raising that kind of capital, you're going to get questions from lenders, uh, from investors of all stripes, as to what are the potential economic effects of the economic regulation of Title II. And Title II, make no mistake, is a statute all about economic regulation. That is exactly what it is. So that could cause a stutter step, as we've seen evidence in the record thus far with those smaller ISPs, uh, for not just smaller ISPs in the 5G space, but the larger ones as well. So that kind of uncertainty is not what we need to uh, win the race to 5G. 
I guess I would ask some other panelists, how would you assure me and assure those of us who are trying to promote 5G that this type of regulation would not impede 5G implementation? Ms. Cicillo? Uh, I don't think that net neutrality regulations impede it. However, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of 5G is based on actually some pay prioritization networks. Um, 5G, I think that people forget, is based on fiber wireline in the ground, and essentially we have to create incentives for companies to want to go into places, especially hard to reach rural communities, poor communities where they're not getting the same return on those that investment. I think that we can create uh, incentives from both the federal and state governments by saying, if you want to get a permit to lay ground lay wire in this district, then you also have to lay it in these other two. I think that there are other creative ways that we can think about this rather than saying that net neutrality is closing a door because if we're giving access to people with net neutrality by saying here, here is something that everyone should have access to this universal platform and concurrently the United States is working on becoming a leader in the 5G network, that does not mean that they have to compete with one another. They might complement one another, but that's going to take some creativity and a commitment from the federal and state governments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McDowell, I keep hearing the word balance uh, more around this debate, given um, that you think no legislation is needed to ensure the rights of consumers or broadband investment. What do you think the FCC should do to prevent throttling, throttling blocking, or prioritization moving forward? So those concepts are all about competition or what's anti-competitive, right? So I think Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act covers that, as do other antitrust statutes. What's important to understand, too, about the FTC, a consumer doesn't have to file an antitrust complaint. The FTC is a consumer protection agency, and thousands of times of ye a year uh, responds to average everyday consumers uh, and acts on their behalf. Uh, it has you know, over $300 million and 600 lawyers to do just that, and that's what they do. You don't need to be spending any money as a consumer or, or worry about time. That's precisely what it does. That's where broadband internet access services are today is at the Federal Trade Commission. Thank you. I Ms. yield Brooke? back. I'm, I'm out of my time. Thank you. I yield Thank back. You. Who's next? Sir? The chair recognizes Ms. Deguette for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I really agree with my colleague, Ms. Brooks, about the, the need to get some certainty here. Um, and and I, I really think it's important but I need, I, when we look at certainty, we need to make sure that we're putting the rights of the consumers and of access first, and that's what I really think. But <clears throat> I was um, so, so happily reminded by my staff that I was on the Energy and Commerce Committee in 2005 when Chairman Martin issued his first version of the net neutrality rules. Then I was on the, still on the subcommittee in 2010 when Chairman Janikowski issued his version of net neutrality rules. And then now I was still on the committee in 2015 when Chairman Reeler issued his version of the rules. And so we've had no shortage of creative approaches to this issue. And of course, we've had court decisions and other things that intervened. And I, I guess I want to ask, I want to start with you, Mr. Green. Would you say that this long-running process has created more or less certainty for your company as you make your business plans? I, I find it to have created less certainty on the long run. I certainly feel your pain in sitting through those, those number of changes. I, I, I would also add that around 5G, number one, we should thank the FCC for removing some barriers to open up things in the area of 5G, so we should appreciate the FCC for the change that they've made and acknowledge that. The other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, this open internet, the very reason we're here today, uh, it's a driving investment for 5G. I mean, that open internet is a right. driver for 5G, so I think it's very, very important to acknowledge that. So, so would, would, would you agree with Ms. Ocello that, that uh, that 5G and open internet are not necessarily uh, uh, counter counter to each other. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I think uh, open internet is a, another access. Uh, first, first of all, the, the one thing you have with open internet is you know you have a common ground in terms of competition, and then from there the competitive demands will drive each, uh, will drive one another. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wood, is there any reason you can see why Congress should s start all over on a whole new bill? 
Uh, no, I don't believe so, Congressman. I think that's the important part about compromise here and the legislative process. I, sometimes I say if we want the same rights, we'll have the same fights about these bills, and I think that's in my testimony. So I don't think that the last f 15 years has been legally certain. That's obvious. The, the rules have gone back and forth. Now, the FCC won when it used Title II and it lost the previous two times, but each time those three lawsuits were brought by cable and telecom providers or their lobbying associations. So if we're tired of ping pong, I would respectfully ask those companies to put down the paddle and just to keep investing as they have done throughout that time. The All trend right. lines have been basically the same and the investment goes up and down over time because as AT&T said, investment is cyclical. They actually called it lumpy. And okay. so companies invest, and we're seeing the wireless companies ramp up their investments but now for 5G. You know, even, even for those companies, like Mr. Green's company, the lack of certainty has to be a real impediment. I think it's a factor, but we haven't seen it in the numbers at the SEC, what the companies tell their investors and analyst calls, despite what Commissioner McDowell said. We don't see analysts or the companies themselves, more importantly, saying there is an impact. And we also see steady, not necessarily sufficient, but steady improvement in rural areas, too, if we look at the FCC's Thank deployment you. data. Thank you. Uh, one last thing, um, and I know some of my colleagues talked about this, but my, my um, congressional district includes Denver, Colorado, which is one of the top places, uh, not only for telecom, but also for millennials moving there. And whenever we talk about um, net neutrality, this is the number one issue that my constituents raise. When I tell my colleagues this, they can hardly believe it sometimes, but it's the number one issue for the constituents. And what they are, what, what they are saying is they think ISPs are mean to an end, whether that's streaming music or, or movies or accessing my congressional website or social, whatever they're trying to do. So my question, my last question for you, Mr. Wood, is what does public opinion polling tell us about what average Americans think about net neutrality? Thank you. It, it is uh, remarkably high, the consistent level of support we saw last April, 86% of people saying they supported keeping the FCC's 2015 rules and opposing that repeal. That included 82% of Republicans. I think most people uh, think of this as common sense. And then when we talk about the edge providers as well, they do see internet access as a means to get there. I want to be clear, we don't have uh, some sort of blank check for edge providers. We think that they are engaging in all sorts of abuses, but they are still different from the wire that gets you there. And that's why people basically want and demand that these rules be restored and be put back the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank the general lady. Chair now recognizes Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Did we run out of uh, the minority, Mr. Thank Chairman? You. Thank they you. All, all they right. Were, they were. They were. T they, they had to leave because of my call. I know. I know. <laughs> let Let me just begin by thanking the four panelists for for coming today, and thank you so much for for your testimony, uh, Commissioner McDowell. I was listening very carefully to to your opening statement, and I just want to thank you for for your thoughtful approach. Uh, to the subject matter. You call for a bipartisan approach. You call for certainty. And uh, I'm going to do something I rarely do. I'm going to take your opening statement home with me tonight, and I'm going to read it again. And so, I'm so thank, sorry. Th thank, <laughs> thank, thank all of you. <laughs> but Commissioner McDowell, in, in 2015, and I too have been here under three chairs, Janikowski, uh, Wheeler, and, and, and Chairman Pai. Uh, but in 2015, the, and I think you had just left a year or two before then, uh, the FCC forbore over 700 regulations that the Commission had the authority to enforce under Title II. Uh, will this bill, as, as we know it, uh, make it more or less difficult for the FCC to utilize its forbearance authority on additional regulations in the future? I'll, I'll take it face value, Chairman uh, Doyle's uh, assertion that the intent is to make it harder for the FCC to wiggle away from the parameters of the bill. But I will say this, as an attorney, There'll be lots of lawyers trying to argue both sides of that. They'll argue every word of it so that the uncertainty doesn't necessarily go away. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, uh, ISPs have expressed concern that the additional regulations under Title II have a chilling effect on their ability to invest in the expansion of their networks. And, and I understand their anxiety. Even though I may not agree with it totally, I certainly understand their anxiety. Uh, how will this bill affect the deployment of rural broadband by ISPs? We've seen in the FCC's record, uh, as well as you're hearing a few weeks ago, uh, and throughout the debate, a concern by the smallest of ISPs. So uh, perhaps we can all say that the, the, the big uh, carriers can take care of themselves. Actually, most of them are, are engaging in M&A in areas outside of broadband in order 
uh, which can also distort, by the way, their CapEx figures. But um, the smaller ISPs, I think, are, are genuinely, sincerely, and um, verifiably very concerned about the questions they'll get from lenders. And that's in the record. It's under oath. It's in a lot of different places. Uh, Mr. Wood, if I can address this to you, sir. Uh, historically, the FCC's policy positions have changed with each administration. Uh, will this bill provide ISPs and other stakeholders with regulatory certainty uh, to innovate and, and to invest? Uh, yes, Congressman, thank you for the question. I, b I believe it will. I would, I would not quibble with the characterization, but I would alter it perhaps slightly to say that the FCC hasn't changed policies. It's just changed the legal grounds on which it's founded those policies. And so when the FCC tried to uh, adopt the Internet principles, open Internet principles in 2005 and grounded those on Title I, they failed in the court of law. Uh, the same thing happened with the Janikowski administration or the Janikowski FCC. They once again were struck down in court. They came back with essentially the same principles. There have been some changes in the wording and, and the rules over time, but we've had the same kind of principles that the FCC has tried to enact three times, and they finally got it right on that third try and were upheld in court two times. All right, Ms. Ashello, uh, thank you for your testimony. In your testimony, you remarked that the way in which we decide to regulate the Internet will have a direct impact on broadband adoption and access. How will this bill create opportunities for communities of color and help to eliminate disparities that you and I know exist uh, in, the, in broadband access? I think that it's important for, thank you very much for the question, um, Congressman. I think that it's important to put net neutrality protections uh, in statute. And I think at this, at this point, we need to be very um, aware of the fact that the people who are left behind in the digital divide don't have an opportunity to come into this space and to basically fend for themselves. And our organization is constantly just trying to explain if we are not aggressive about saying we need to actually make sure that no one can have discriminatory practices to make sure that access is a priority for congressmen, for everybody, uh, whether it's a provider, for everybody, there is actually a cost when people can't get online. And I think that it's important for us to support this type of legislation because at least it gives people an opportunity to acknowledge that the, the internet is like a utility. It is something that everyone needs. And the truth is that even the FCC has acknowledged that it is essential for every single part of daily life. And I think that this is something that supports that proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back 16 seconds. I thank the gentleman, and I would uh, comment that while I, my good friend Mr. McDowell acknowledges that the bill uh, would make it, uh, would make it uh, prohibit uh, forbearance, uh, unforbearing what has been forbeared in the order, uh, that we all understand his comment that an attorney will argue anything as long as someone will pay him to do it. So <laughs> I, I think that, 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 that's something we're never going to change, no matter what the bill looks like. Uh, but I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Schrader, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you for bringing the, the bill to the hearing here. It's a good opportunity for us to have this debate. Uh, the testimony has been informative for me, at least, and look forward to uh, moving on and hopefully uh, come to some bipartisan agreement, as everyone has talked about at some point in time. Uh, the best legislation stand the test of time through various administrations and different commissioners. Uh, it would be best if we uh, actually got together and tried to come up with a, a compromise that would work for, for everybody out there, because we all do want a free and open Internet at the end of the day. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I see that Mr. Welsh has entered the room, and uh, he's recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing, leadership, uh, on this. Uh, We've got a, in, and I've missed some of the testimony, but watched some of it on TV. Mr. McDowell, it's good to see you uh, back. The, uh, you know, the bill that we have, I know you've discussed this, but it really seems practical to me. There's uniformity uh, that we don't want blocking or throttling uh, or some of the other things. We also don't want the heavy hand of regulation. And uh, what I thought was very wise about th the proposal here was that we guaranteed there would not be all the Title II concerns. Uh, and that was in response, frankly, to a lot of our colleagues uh, and some of the folks in industry uh, expressing apprehension about the uncertainty with uh, the potential of heavy-handed Title II regulation. Uh, I wasn't fearful of that. You know, Mr. Wheeler, when he was the head of the committee, or the, when he was the chair uh, for forbear, but 
uh, trust but verify. Uh, so I, I, this to me makes a lot of sense and I hope that uh, we ultimately can proceed. Uh, but so thank you Mr. Doyle on that. I wanna go to uh, Mr. Green, I, I think you've been asked this uh, already um, but I'd like to hear it again because a lot of the argument that we've had here is about this crucial question of how will you deploy broadband in the apprehension that some folks have that unless there's certainty, it'll inhibit the deployment of broadband. That's an incredible concern to Republicans and Democrats on this committee who represent rural areas because we have been left behind and it's intolerable. So you were investing before under the old rules and you're investing now under the new rules. And I'd like you to just elaborate on that because I think all of us at the end of the day want to be confident that there is going to be investment to deploy broadband. Well, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, we have had uh, excellent success and we've been very fortunate and we've been blessed. Uh, I always like to mention that because that's from a higher calling from my, from my perspective, but we have $30 million of fiber assets in the ground today. We started in 2010. I'm just an old telecom guy from Spokane, Washington, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, but the investments that, at the moment, to answer your question more specifically, we have $10 million of backlog, meaning we have $10 million of customers who have requested services from us to reach the internet, and at the moment, we are deploying um, that capital so that we can get those customers connected to the internet. So. We're having great success. If you look at the fact that we have $30 million in the ground, right. and in the last year we've created another $10 million of demand, that's obviously telling you the demand is great, and it becomes greater and greater every day. It's a combination of 5G, it's a combination of you know, the cloud streaming, all of those sorts of things. And so um, we're having excellent success, and have had excellent success during the tenure of our company, and, and certainly from 2000, the act, or, uh, of 2015. So th this act, in your view, would not, uh, this proposal by, uh, uh, authored by Mr. Doyle, would not inhibit your uh, plans going forward? Not at all. All right. The, uh, you know, my goal here is in, on the committee with respect to internet has been to do two things, expand broadband in rural areas uh, in across the country, and second, guarantee that the internet remains free and open. I think we're all on the same, on the same page on that. But in my rural state, we uh, are not debating 5G. We're dealing with no G in many places. And it's got to be a decision that we make in this Congress as to whether we're going to treat Internet much like we did electricity uh, in the 1930s. And there's not an economic case to be made to put it out in rural America. But there's a social case to be made. We're all in it together or we're not. Do you see having clarification about these rules that are codified in this proposed legislation as being helpful to accomplish that? I'll ask you, Mr. McDowell. I'll let you weigh in on that. So first of all, let me say something at the outset, which is, and I know we don't have much time, but that open internet and Title II don't have to be synonymous or exclusively synonymous to each other. From the time the internet was privatized in the mid-90s until the 2015 Title II order, we had an open and freedom enhancing internet. I think that's very important. It's, it's been raised here a few times that the only way you can have an open internet is by bringing in Title II. You might be able to bring in a, a principle of Title II. I think it's better to start with the 2005 principles uh, from Chairman Powell, but Title II is not synonymous with an open internet and brings in a whole host of collateral uh, circumstances and unintended consequences. So um, that is what provides a lot of uh, investment uncertainty or just operational uncertainty going forward, especially as ISPs, it was said earlier, are, are merely a, a means to an end. Actually, ISPs are converging into many business lines and offering multiple services and benefits to consumers, just the way edge providers are providing not just content and apps or algorithms, but also delivery systems. So as you see this convergence, I think it's important for this committee to take that into account as you come up with a new piece of legislation. Sorry, Mr. Back. Chairman. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity for us to um, talk on this bill and, and have a better understanding of what's going on out there and how 
we're going to effectuate change, especially when it comes to consumer protection. Um, one of the goals of this legislation is to codify the provision of the 2015 rules that forbears uh, 700 regulations from applying to Internet service providers. During the last hearing uh, here, former FCC Chairman Wheeler argued that some of the most onerous provisions of the Title II regulation don't make sense for the Internet, which is why the FCC forbore these provisions in the 2015 order. This component is important to balance consumer protection while also ensuring business can invest and build their networks on consumers uh, which have great products to choose from. Uh, so Mr. Wood uh, and Commissioner McDowell, if this bill is enacted into law, could any future FCC apply any of those regulations that have put in uh, forbearance, that are put into forbearance? Uh, you said my name first. I guess I'll go first. Thank you, Congressman. I don't believe so. As we've heard, that could be litigated, and that's obviously true. I would point to the uh, decades of lucrative litigation after the 96 Act to reinforce Chairman Doyle's notion that any new bill could be litigated. I think this one is actually very tightly written, though, and would prevent that kind of uh, retreat by the FCC. So you see that this bill would protect against that if it becomes law? I think that's exactly what it says, that it would basically ratify the 2015 decisions and make those part of the statute or part of a congressional enactment rather than leaving it to the FCC to strictly determine forbearance. I should say that over the years that is what they've done. They've forborne from wireless voice and from non-dominant carrier regulation of broadband uh, when it's sold to businesses. Okay. So we do have a track record of that, but this bill would make Thank Congress you. giving the stamp of approval to that. Thank you. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, given sort of the long lens of history and the history of common carriage regulation, I would say no, that actually history, the trajectory of history is on the side of sort of a one-way ratchet of common carrier reg uh, regulation, that once you have some, you're going to get more. So uh, I would respectfully say that this bill actually would, would open the door and not close the door to more regulation. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you have a opposite answer to Mr. Wood. That's yeah. right. We never disagree. <laughs> you always used to talk about the bipartisanship at the FCC, right? It's 95% uh, okay. of the time we agree, sir. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wood, uh, can you talk about how Lifeline Broadband was provided before the 2015 rules? Uh, before the 2015 rules, uh, sure. The FCC has for some time been asking this question, and before they reclassified, uh, basically the FCC was relying on Section 706 and other authorities it has to say, well, we can uh, provide support at least for telecom companies, because that's the way the universal service statute is written. You have to be an eligible telecommunications carrier. So basically, the FCC allowed uh, telephone companies to provide Lifeline, but it didn't have great mechanisms for requiring that they do. We think the 2015 order actually got that right and treated broadband as a telecom service. And now, not only has the PI FCC walked away from Title II, they've also said Section 706 is not a source of authority. So now we're not really sure what they can do, at least on a solid legal basis, uh, speaking of litigation. Can you give uh, an example on what, uh, of what way the 2015 rules impacted Lifeline programs? Well, I think uh, we talked about this a bit earlier, Ms. Oshella talked about it too. There were nine providers who were offering a broadband-only product, or at least planned to. I believe one of them had launched service in Queens, New York, and they were cut off from the program because the FCC basically said, we have no way of funding you anymore if you're not a, an eligible telecommunications carrier, to use the words in the statute in Title II. So it, this legislation, if enacted to law, into law, Mr. Wood, um, it would affect, in your opinion, it would affect the opportunity for lifeline programs in a good way to flourish more, or would it limit them? I think it would clarify that broadband is a telecom service and fully eligible for eligible telecommunications carrier status and thus for support under the deployment aspects and also under the lifeline program and universal service. Okay. It, but just so there's no uh, uh, confusion, you know, under the second Obama, uh, or the first Obama term, FCC, in 2011 and early 2012, we expanded lifeline support and other universal service support to broadband, right? So that was before the 2015 Title II order at the FCC. So I, I want to make sure folks are, are understanding that Lifeline is supported even if it's not a telecommunications service. And I would just ask under what authority that, that step was taken, if it was Section 706 or if it was Section 254 or some other uh, sort of murkier cloud of authority. Well, all of the above, that uh, case went to the Tenth Circuit under a variety of theories and survived appeal. Mr. Wood? What section do you think? I think it survived appeal because they had 706, and now this FCC has said, not only do we not want to use Title II, we don't think Section 706 is a grant of substantive authority. So now I'm not really sure what's left of what survived in the Tenth Circuit if we actually see another challenge to that. So with what, what time I have left, Mr. Chairman, I think it's important, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for us taking on this responsibility because when we don't do our job as a legislature, then we leave 
the appointed officials to do the job. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I don't want anyone to think that we're ignoring Ms. McMorris-Rogers over here, but she's going to wave on to the committee, and under our rules, uh, she would be entitled to speak after uh, all members of the committee have spoke. Uh, so, Mr. Lujan, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and to our ranking member for holding this important hearing. Mr. Wood, yes or no, does Mr. Doyle's legislation prevent Internet service providers from blocking content? It does. It restores the rules. Yes or no, does this legislation prevent the throttling of content? Yes. Yes or no, does it prohibit paid prioritization? Yes. Yes or no, does the Republican proposal clearly prevent blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization? Uh, some do that. They have some, some different approaches. Some say they would uh, prohibit other behaviors, and some actually do try to adopt the three bright line rules, but in ways that we think are not sufficient to fully protect Internet users. Yes or no, am I correct that Mr. Doyle's legislation prevents the FCC from applying 700 regulations under the Communications Act? Yes, I think that is the count. Beyond that, though, does Mr. Doyle's legislation include any other provisions that would unreasonably or needlessly handcuff the FCC, including the authority to engage in rulemaking going forward? Uh, no, I don't believe so, and I think that's key, that rulemaking authority is preserved and the FCC is in, uh, handcuffed in doing its job to implement this statute. Yes or no, is that true of the proposals introduced by my Republican colleagues? Uh, again, I think they differ in some respects from each other, but no, it is not true as a, as a rule. Let's put aside the legislation before us today. Do you think it would be reasonable for Democrats who support a free and open Internet, meaning no blocking, no throttling, and no paid prioritization to trade codifying those provisions for a Federal Communications Commission without meaningful rulemaking authority going forward? No, I don't believe that would be a wise trade. Why not? Well, we've talked about a lot of the things that the FCC does outside of net neutrality under Title II, so the lifeline discussion with Mr. Cardenas and the rest of Universal Service is a good example of that. But then there are also these questions that the FCC was trying to answer and needs to be able to answer about whether or not discriminatory conduct is in fact unreasonable, even if it doesn't fit neatly within one of the bright line rules. So we don't see that as a problem. In fact, we see that as, as necessary, that the FCC have some residual authority as it's granted in Section 202 of the, of the Communications Act to assess other kinds of unreasonable behavior, even if they don't fit into the bright lines that this body may draw at some point in the near future. Those were uh, very similar points that I raised during the 2015 hearings on this particular subject. Um, uh, there was uh, either markup or hearings on uh, legislation that was introduced by Republican colleagues, and this was an area that I focused on from a rulemaking perspective. On another subject, can you also tell us why interconnection protections are so important? Uh, sure. W so what we've seen in the last half decade or so is occasionally, or probably even more than occasionally, but with one especially well-documented period, uh, millions of Internet users were not getting the content that they had chosen to receive at the speeds that they deserved. And that wasn't because of congestion in the last mile, as it's sometimes called, but a congestion outside of the network uh, that comes to your home, the, the last mile broadband network. And there were some disputes about what was causing that. But we think the evidence shows that companies like Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon were choking off the flow of information at that point. And then they demanded payments, in some cases struck deals with not just Netflix, but also with other kinds of carriers. And that resolved the situation, at least to our knowledge. But we think there has to be some sort of oversight of that kind of behavior. And I think to your rulemaking point, too, this is exactly why we need it. You know, we've heard a lot about the FTC today and other contexts. One of the things people note about the FTC is that it is not always able to do the best job it could do because it lacks rulemaking authority. So while we talk about granting rulemaking authority to the FTC at times, I think we have to remember we shouldn't take it away from this agency to address these kinds of new problems and new uh, impacts on Internet users. Uh, and that's why this bill is actually the right way to go to keep that residual substantive authority as well as the agency's discretion to implement it. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, are uh, interconnections important to small ISPs across America? Uh, absolutely. Interconnections are uh, an important part. Interoperability as well and standards all related. What are your thoughts with the importance of inclusion of interconnection protections uh, to ensure that small ISPs are able to survive? So what happened since the Internet was privatized in the mid-90s until the Title II order of 2015 uh, is that you didn't have Title II uh, governing that, right? So uh, you had a thriving Internet marketplace uh, with ISPs, small WISPs, et cetera, many of them in New Mexico, uh, without Title II. So why was that? Well, you had... Well, being a former utility commissioner myself, I can tell you that many of those ISPs had to go before the local utility commission, and the committee, the commission itself, had to require... Uh, some of those interconnection agreements be enforced because 
of the lack of rule of law. It, it, well, no, in that there were uh, Title II common care uh, transmission components uh, that they were either leasing or offering uh, themselves. That's where uh, the common carriage came in, and that's where state jurisdiction came in, was through the Title II transmission component of all that. But there's uh, Section 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act, Section 3 of the Clayton Act, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, all of that could help in that regard. I take that. Mr. Chairman, I'll be submitting a, a question to the record for Ms. Ochio uh, based on her profound um, testimony as well, especially looking at uh, comparison between New Mexico and New York, and I very much appreciate where that testimony is going. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair now requests unanimous consent to allow Ms. M Morris Rogers to waive on to the committee without objection, so ordered, and I now recognize her for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you being willing to have me join you all today, and I continue to seek a bipartisan solution to address this issue of net neutrality. And I believe that there, are, there is uh, bipartisan support for the bright lines, for uh, blocking, uh, you know, making clear no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. Uh, I, I am, I'm very disappointed to see the majority moving forward without really um, seeking a bipartisan solution. Um, it's clear that this bill will not go anywhere in the Senate, and if it is as dire as the other side continues to to suggest, then I would I would implore this committee to come together in a bipartisan way. I believe that there is uh, a, really an opportunity for us to come together and stop politicizing this issue. What we continue to see is a lot of rhetoric around net neutrality that has really been driven to a fever pitch. We see dire predictions as to the end of the internet. We, we saw threats against the chairman of the FCC and his family, death threats, as well as some of our own colleagues. And if it were truly the crisis that it's made out to be, I believe that there should be more willingness to solve it uh, instead of moving uh, ahead with a, a partisan approach. Uh, this, this bill is not going to pass the Senate. It's not going to be signed into law, and it's, it's not really intended to do that. It's, a, uh, it's apparent the goal is not about protecting consumers, innovation, and Internet. It's about scoring political point, points. Uh, for those who say they want to save the Internet, however, in the time since Title II was repealed, Network speeds are up dr uh, drastically. Investment and coverage in rural areas has increased. As we work to continue to close the digital divide, we need to decrease barriers to deployment, not increase them. I agree we need to protect consumers, but we also need to do it in a way that does not leave underserved areas of our country behind. I represent a, a rural area of eastern Washington where we continue to have broadband needs and we need more deployment. Republicans for years have been offering to work with the Democrats to find an agreement only to be blocked and denied again and again. Earlier this year, Mr. Walden, Mr. Latta and I introduced three separate reasonable solutions to protect consumers and ensure the internet remains free and open. My bill is based upon a law that passed in Washington state with overwhelming bipartisan uh, support signed into law by jo uh, Governor Jay Inslee. It gives the FCC clear authority to enforce the bright line rules of net neutrality. No blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. It's a solution that does not institute changes to the internet that would stop innovation, stifle broadband deployment, and leave millions of Americans behind. If my friends on the other side would like changes to my bill or others, we, we need to have that conversation. Let's work together. Let, it's time to end the regulatory and legal confusion and bring certainty to consumers and the marketplace. We want to guarantee that the United States remains a leader of technological innovation that we've been the last 20 years. We want every American to have access to the internet and the, the economic and social and educational benefits that connection brings. We want to ensure that the next generation of networks originate here ushering in a new era of technology that we can't even now imagine. And we should want to do it in a bipartisan way. As Senator Cantwell tweeted when the Washington State bill became law, quote, in our state, Republicans and Democrats came together. Why can't we see this same bipartisanship in the U.S. House? And I would like um, unanimous consent to enter into the record various tweets of support from Republicans and Democrats for the Washington state law. Without objection, so ordered. 
Mr. McDowell, can you speak to the bipartisan consensus you saw around the issue, both at the commission and here in Congress, prior to Wheeler's FCC move to reclassify broadband under Title II in 2015? Sure, in 2005, which is about a year before I got to the FCC under Chairman Powell, there was the unanimous bipartisan um, adoption of the internet uh, uh, freedom principles, uh, the consumer kind of bill of rights for the internet, if you will. And I think that's what could be the, the starting point. Subsequent to that, though, you had bipartisan and unanimous votes after the Brand X decision, which was in June of 2005, the Supreme Court decision, um, making sure that it was clear that cable modem and broadband over power line and DSL and wireless broadband, all of those were uh, properly classified under Title I. And those were unanimous and bipartisan through the year of 2007. But I think of what we've seen today and in other discussions uh, is you know, no anti-competitive conduct that involves throttling and, and blocking and, and prioritization that's anti-competitive, et cetera. I think those are great starting points for where you could have an overwhelming bipartisan majority of both houses. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll yield back and just urge again that we come together and do this in a bipartisan way. I thank, thank the you. general lady. Uh, let me just say a few things. Um, if the minority desires uh, a bipartisan approach and wants to work with the majority, uh, they should let us know about that. I got no phone call from the chair or the ranking member of the subcommittee uh, that they were interested in sitting down to discuss this. What we got instead was three bills that were dropped without our knowledge, uh, without us being informed in advance that you were going to do that. Uh, and then we got a letter that we didn't know was coming also uh, on it. Uh, I would suggest a better approach uh, would be to sit down and talk with us before you drop bills. Uh, I know that after being in the majority for so long, it might be difficult for some of my friends to recognize that they're not anymore uh, and that the proper approach would be to talk to us before you drop bills. Let me say a couple other things too. This has been tried a long time. We talk about the ping pong that's gone on and it, and it has. Um, but you know, when this was tried by the FCC under Title I, uh, back uh, initially in, in 2005, uh, uh, eventually Comcast, it was done as a, as a as, uh, not a rule, but as a set of principles. Uh, but when it was put in, in rule form, Comcast sued and the commission lost. Uh, in 2010, once again, uh, when the commission tried to do net neutrality rules under Title I, Verizon sued, and the commission lost. Uh, under 215, uh, Chairman Wheeler uh, again put net neutrality rules that were anchored under Title II, and it survived two challenges in court. That's where we are today. What are Democrats doing with this bill? We're stepping towards our colleagues. Our colleagues and people in the industry express concern uh, that Title II, with all its regulations, some which have no applicability to today's internet, uh, and, and the over 27 sections and 700 regulations, even though Commissioner Wheeler had forbeared on them, that a future FCC commissioner could unforbear, and that caused them great concern. So what we've done to address those concerns and step towards our colleagues is to codify the 2015 Open Internet Order, which also codifies the forbearance, which means those 700 regulations and 27 sections are no longer applicable. And uh, while my good friend Mr. McDowell says attorneys can file lawsuits, well, that's what attorneys do. And, and no matter what bill was, was put forward, that could happen. So this was a good faith effort uh, to move in their direction. I would remind my colleagues that in the Senate, uh, for the CRA, 52 members voted for the CRA uh, in the Senate, and that was before we have codified forbearance, basically eliminating 700 regulations and, and uh, sections under Title II. So we are trying to, to work in a, in, a, in a new way uh, to put uh, out a bill that, that recognizes some of the concerns we've heard from the minority and from some of those people in the industry uh, and uh, we're going to continue to move forward in regular order. Uh, we've had our hearing today. We intend to put this through a subcommittee markup and then a full committee markup. Uh, the minority will certainly have opportunities at that time to express uh, their opinions and their amendments, and, and we look forward to that. Uh, to the extent that they want to talk to us in advance about things we may be able to work on together, I, I would recommend that would be a good course of action. Uh, so with that, 
Uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. Uh, number one, an opening statement from Representative Eshoo, an editorial from the Houston Chronicle, an op-ed from The Hill, uh, a Los, uh, LA Times editorial, a letter from Alvanza, a blog from Alvanza, statement from CITA, a statement from the NCTA, U.S. Telecom blog, tweet from Rick Balcher, Bloomberg article, Politico Pro article, Washington Post editorial, The Hill editorial, East Oregonian op-ed by Joseph Fresnel, multi-channel article, letter from Tech Freedom to Chairman Doyle and ranking member Latta. Is that everything? Without objection, so ordered. I want to now thank the witnesses uh, for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, we appreciate uh, your testimony and we appreciate uh, how patiently you have sat there and answered every question that was thrown at you. Uh, and, and it's been very helpful to this committee. I want to remind members that pursuant to our committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. And I would ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. At this time, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, Thanks, Billy.